his support of uh, tonight's event, uh, their, gen their generosity in the facility. Uh, we're also very thankful uh, to both speakers for coming this evening uh, to take on this task of uh, addressing this very critical issue of textual criticism, um, how we as Christians today get our Bibles uh, when it was first written um, thousands of years ago. So uh, please allow me to first introduce both of the speakers. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Costa first. Uh, Dr. Tony Costa, he has earned a BA and an MA in the study of religion, biblical studies, and a philosophy from the University of Toronto. Tony received his PhD in the area of theology and New Testament studies from Rudbound University in the Netherlands. His area of expertise is biblical and systematic theology, cults, the new, uh, the new age movement, and comparative, new, uh, comparative world religion with specialization in Islam. Tony is also an ordained minister of the gospel. As a Christian apologist, Dr. Costa gives reason for valid belief in Christianity and also advocates for the unique claim of Jesus Christ. He also lectures and debates at various universities and colleges on the existence of God, Muslim-Christian uh, relations, as well as the credibility of the Christian faith. Tony is a professor of apologetics with the Toronto Baptist Seminary. He also teaches as an instructor with the School of Continuing, Edu uh, Continuing Studies at the University of Toronto in the area of New Testament studies and the Second Temple Ju uh, Judaism. He serves as an adjunct professor with Heritage College and Seminary in Cambridge, Ontario, and Providence Theological Seminary in Franklin, Tennessee. Tony is also a member of the Network of Christian Scholars in Canada. He has also lectured throughout Canada, the United States, and overseas. He's an author of worship and risen Jesus in the Pauline letters, as well as a contributor to scholarly essays in Christian origins and Greco-Roman culture, and Christian origins, and Hellenistic Ju Judaism, and various journals. Tony is happily married to a wonderful wife. He has three children, a grandson, and he resides in Toronto, Canada. Our other speaker is John Torres, and John Torres has been studying and teaching Christian apologetics for more than 35 years. He's a holder of Bachelor of Applied Science degree in Chemical Engineer from the University of Toronto and a Master of Divinity degree, degree from the Ontario Theological Seminary. John served as a pastor at the Toronto Formosan Presbyterian Church and Mississauga Christian Church. He has also taught, lectured, and preached on apologetic topics in, in numerous churches for groups such as Inter-Christian inter Fellowship, the Navigators, he currently teaches both philosophy and creation and evolution section of biology at Whitfield Christian Collegiate Institute. And he has previously taught physics there as well. John's letter defending Christianity and the Bible have been published in many Christian periodicals, including World Magazine, Faith Today, and the Presbyterian Record, as well as such secular publication as Skeptical Inquirer, Sky and Telescope, Magazine, The Toronto Star, The Globe and Mail, and The American Spectator. And in an online edition of New Scientist and The New York Times. John has been married for almost 29 years. He and his wife, Adrian, have raised three homeschool daughters. These are our speakers this evening. Uh, before I invite them and provide them the opportunity to begin their introduction to tonight's debate, I would like to open with a word of prayer and let us pray. Father God, we give you thanks and praise. Um, we're thankful uh, for the opportunity tonight to gather as brothers and sisters. We're thankful for this opportunity to be able uh, to listen to both speakers uh, and for them to demonstrate to us how your words have been preserved over the centuries and how we know that we indeed have the word of God to learn, to study, and to understand your will in our lives. Father God, we pray that you would anoint the lips of both speakers, even though they may share, uh, they may have different positions. Uh, we pray that as uh, brothers in Christ, uh, that they may uh, come together uh, to demonstrate and to discuss this uh, issue openly 
and lead us into proper understanding. Father God, we thank you and we pray that your spirit be upon us. And as we uh, continue to listen this evening, we pray that you open our hearts and minds uh, to the words that are being spoken here and help us to consider both cases and make wise decisions in life um, as disciples of Christ. And we thank you in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Now I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Coney Costa as he will be going first. He will have 35 minutes for his introduction. <clears throat> well, good evening, brothers and sisters. I think I'm a little too loud here. It's a pleasure for me to be here tonight. Uh, usually when I'm engaging in these types of events, I, I'm usually up against atheists and Mormons and cultists and, uh, and Muslims and everyone else. And so I'm so glad tonight that I could take a break and actually have a discussion and a dialogue with a brother in Christ. And I, I've known uh, Pastor John Torres for many years and I esteem him as a dear brother. And so tonight we're going to be discussing the issue of the majority or the critical text, the methodology behind the reconstruction of the New Testament. And I applaud all of you for being here tonight because this is not a light subject. This is not something that people usually are willing to give up a Saturday evening to come and listen to two speakers talk about manuscripts and ancient texts and Greek and uh, various languages and so forth. So I commend you for that. And I'm very thankful for, Toronto, uh, for the Toronto Free Presbyterian Church for allowing this event to take place because these are very important matters and we simply cannot just brush them away. We have to address these subjects. Let me begin by saying that the original texts or the manuscripts of the New Testament, the original writings of the New Testament alone were inspired by God. And what I mean by that is the actual text that Paul wrote, the actual text that Matthew wrote, that John wrote, that Luke wrote, etc. Those original texts are the texts that are inspired by God. These original manuscripts are known as the autographa or autographs. And so when I make reference to the autographs, I'm referring to these original writings. Now, the fact of the matter is that we do not possess any of these original manuscripts or the original text of the New Testament. We just don't have those original texts penned by the original writers. There are no original texts of any writer from antiquity. So it's not just the New Testament, and uh, we're not dealing with the Old Testament tonight, but the same applies to the Old Testament. We don't have any uh, original writings of any classical writer, whether it's Plato, Homer, Thucydides, uh, Suetonius, and Tacitus, and so forth. All we have are copies of copies that are very late, that is from these classical writers, in comparison to the New Testament manuscripts. So all we then have are at our disposal are these copies, copies of copies of copies, thousands of copies. And many of them are fragmentary. And so when we talk about these manuscripts, some of them are quite fragmentary. So uh, one of them I'll show you tonight is known as P52, Papyrus 52, and it's the size of a credit card. So uh, we have to uh, understand that we're not talking about full copies of these texts when we talk about uh, manuscripts. These manuscripts uh, obviously were written by hand. That's why they're called manuscript, that is writing with the hand. And therefore, we don't have Xerox copies. We don't have facsimiles. We don't have faxes from the Apostle Peter and so forth. All we have are these manuscript copies. So in the absence of the original text of the New Testament, which we do not have, how can we be sure and confident that we still have the New Testament today? That's the question that is before us today. And so this is going to be a question of methodology, and that's why the debate has been framed as the methodology for reconstructing the text of the New Testament. So the idea of the process by which the scriptures came to us, and I thought I'd um, present you with this little uh, picture here, this illustration. The autographs, of course, are written by the original writer. And so God, by the Holy Spirit, revealed his words to the original writers. And those autographs, at a very early period, would have been written. Oh, they're not up there? Oh, okay. My apologies. Can I just back up a bit? Sorry. 
Um, that's the first. Uh, I mean, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, I was explaining. I can get I can get this uh, email if you'd like. So uh, don't uh, don't despair. My apologies. Um, I was never trained in in techie stuff. So when you have biblical studies, you have no time for that other stuff. So uh, inspiration then involves uh, the act of God disclosing, God revealing uh, His revelation, His words to the biblical writers, and that's what we call the autographs. And as I pointed out, at a very early stage, those autographs would have been copied, and copied, and copied, and copied. And so in the early church, when the apostles began to write, for example, when the apostle Paul began writing his letters, uh, it would have been uh, normal and natural for people to want copies of those letters to share with the other churches. Many of Paul's letters were cyclical letters. They were letters that were to be sent around in the churches. Now, just to give you an idea of how uh, the manuscripts of the New Testament fare, they fare quite well when we compare the New Testament manuscripts with the copies of the manuscripts we have from other ancient writers, you will notice that the New Testament enjoys, in the words of Dr. Bruce Metzger, we enjoy uh, an embarrassing treasure here of riches. We, the New Testament is the most attested text in antiquity, and so originally it would have been written, uh, this graph has uh, 50 to 100 AD, I believe that um, that some parts of the New Testament were written much earlier than 50 AD. And you will notice that the earliest copies we have uh, range from, they have 65 to 150, but the earliest uh, would be around 112 or so, 115. And you'll notice that the time between the original and the copies for the New Testament is quite short, 50 to 200 years. And you compare that, for example, with uh, the Iliad by Homer, or the histories by Herodotus, you'll notice the time gap between the original writing of those texts and the first earliest copy that we have is staggering. Sometimes you're dealing with not, not, not just centuries, sometimes you're dealing with over a millennium before you actually get an original copy, or excuse me, a copy of that, uh, that writer. And so when it comes to the New Testament, uh, we truly have an embarrassment of riches. The New Testament is the most well-attested text in antiquity beyond all other uh, ancient writers. So here is a picture of uh, P52, Papyrus 52, uh, that is uh, uh, housed in the John Rylands uh, Library today in Manchester, England. And uh, this, this papyrus is about the size of a, of a credit card. It's quite small. And what you have on this papyrus is you have writing on both sides. And what is interesting is that you have John 18, 31, 33 on one side, and on the other side, you have John 18, 37 to 38. And the uh, irony about this papyrus is that this is the section where Jesus is being interviewed by Pontius Pilate, and this is the section where Pilate is actually asking Jesus, what is truth? Quite interesting that uh, we find this in this little fragment here. This is considered the earliest uh, fragment that we have today of the New Testament coming from the Gospel of John. Um, I hope, hope to see this here. There's been talk about another uh, papyrus that has been discovered um, that is the, considered the earliest, and it is a papyrus of the Gospel of Mark. And um, they've been talking about, Craig Evans and Daniel Wallace have been talking about the publication of this, and we're hoping to see something come out sometime this year. Uh, and if the dating is correct on this uh, papyrus, we will have the earliest document that comes from the first century. And then we have another papyrus here, uh, P66. Notice the date is AD 175, which is quite early. Um, and here you have a copy of the Gospel of John. And uh, if you know your Greek, you'll, you'll know the top left corner, it, uh, it has the beginning of the Gospel. In the beginning was the Word. So when we talk about inspiration, this is very important for our, our purposes. As I pointed out, the original texts are the texts that are inspired. Uh, I don't, and I don't think uh, Pastor John would attribute uh, inerrancy to a modern translation. Some people do. Uh, 
Some people think modern translations. Um, Peter Ruckman, founder, uh, one of the proponents of the King James only movement, argues that the King James, uh, the Texas Receptus, should actually be used to correct the Greek text and not the other way around. Here in these two passages in 2 Peter 1, 20-21 and 2 Timothy 3, 16-17, uh, both these apostles tell us that prophecy of Scripture came to men uh, not by any human um, uh, will, not by even any private interpretation, but this prophecy was, was given by the Holy Spirit as men spoke from God. Notice the sources from God as they were carried along. 2 Timothy 3.16-17 to tells us that all Scripture is God-breathed. Now, some translations, like the uh, New American Standard Bible and the King James Version, will, will speak of it as inspiration by God. But I think the word God breathed or breathed out by God, as the ESV has that, I think is a much better translation. Because the word that you see underneath there in the Greek text, if I can just uh, point at it there with uh, the uh, laser pointer here. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I just turned myself off again. My apologies. Um, the laser pointer is on the side, is that correct? Laser pointer? IT experts, IT pros? It's in the middle. Uh, okay, sorry. All right, so it's that word over there, that word there, theonostos. Theonostos is the Greek word that is translated inspiration, God breathed, and so forth. And it's important to realize that uh, only the original manuscripts or autographs are theonostos, that is, that they are inerrant and without error. So the manuscript copies that we have today, uh, it doesn't matter if we're talking about the majority text or the Alexandrian text, um, are not inspired or God-breathed, um, but contain many textual variants or differences in readings. And this applies to all manuscripts of uh, the uh, various text families of the New Testament. And what we mean by textual variance is that some of these manuscripts have different readings. Some of them have different words when you compare the two together. Now, it's important to realize that God never said that he would keep the scribes or the copiers of the manuscripts from error, or that they would be inspired like the original biblical writers. As great men as they were, the King James translators were not inspired writers. Neither, were, neither was Erasmus or any scribe of the New Testament or the Old Testament for that matter. Thus, because these are human copiers or scribes, we would expect to find many variants in the copies of the manuscripts because to err is human. That's one thing that we all humans have in common. We know that we can err. And we also know that uh, as many times as you try to edit a given book or a given text or a given essay, you'll always notice there's errors there. Uh, some, some people have uh, written books, and, and I've reviewed a number of them, and you'd be surprised how many typos I find in them, even after they've gone to several revisions. So the reason why we have so many manuscripts in our manus uh, many variants in our manuscripts is because we have so many copies. And why do we have so many copies? Well, this isn't my cat. This is for you cat lovers out there. Uh, the problem with the New Testament is that we got too many copies. Um, it's not a matter, it's, it's something like a puzzle uh, of a thousand pieces, but we've got 1,400 pieces. We've got these extra pieces, and the goal here is to weed out uh, those pieces that don't fit the puzzle. And that's where we get these variants. These variants are, if you will, uh, different readings uh, that have crept into the text, sometimes unintentionally by the author or the scribe, sometimes intentionally. We have examples in the New Testament manuscripts where the scribes intentionally made changes uh, to the text. Sometimes they would harmonize text. Sometimes they would expand text. Sometimes they would delete certain words from certain texts to make them harmonize uh, and so forth. So then, how does one reconstruct the original text of the New Testament? How do we get back to the original? That is our question. That is our pursuit. That is the question tonight. How do we get back to the original? There are some liberal scholars today, like Bart Ehrman, who believe that you can never go back to the original. In fact, he has uh, argued that there's no point talking about an original text because he feels that it's absolutely hopeless. But that's not my view. That's not the view of many uh, other uh, theologians and, uh, and scholars in the field. We believe that God has spoken and that God has revealed his word, that God has preserved his word, but he's preserved that word in 
the manuscript families. And that God throughout history has sovereignly, as he saw fit, to give his word in various ways. We will later talk about the uh, emphasis of the Latin Vulgate, the influence that the Latin Vulgate had on the church for 1,100 years, um, and how God used the Latin Vulgate to, to change the lives of men like uh, um, John Wycliffe and, and uh, Jan Hus and, and many others. So textual criticism, then, is the methodology that we use to achieve this end. Now, when some people look at the word textual criticism, some people immediately put on the defensive gear, and they feel that textual criticism is an attack on Scripture, or that it's an attack on the integrity of Scripture. All the term textual textual criticism means uh, is um, the art or the science of reconstructing and restoring the original text. So it is a a science, it is a a methodology that we use that sometimes involves judgment and involves decisions. And this was undertaken by uh, people like Erasmus when when he put together uh, his uh, first printed published Greek New Testament. Uh, This was uh, also uh, done by the King James translators. They had to make decisions between the dozen manuscripts that they used. They also consulted the Latin Vulgate and so forth. So if we have two different readings in a manuscript, how do we know which one is the original reading? So let's say, for example, we have uh, uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Now, did Paul say there, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God, where he uses the uh, indicative echomen, or did Paul say, therefore being justified by faith, let us have peace with God, where he uses the subjunctive? Um, so which of these two is the word that Paul used? Did he use echomen with uh, the omega or echomen with the omicron? They sound the same when you pronounce them. But there is variance in the, in the manuscripts uh, of Romans 5 on which of these words, uh, both of these words appear in the manuscript tradition. So which of these two did Paul actually use? Well, you're going to have to engage in some form of textual criticism, some form of judgment to decide which of the two he used. How and why did these variants get into the text? There's many uh, causes that, uh, that have borne uh, out the, the emergence of, of variants in the text. We don't have time to go into this at any depth. But no two manuscripts are identical. And this applies to all the manuscript families. And there are about six to ten differences between two closely related chapters of any given text of Scripture, if you compare the two. Does this mean we cannot reconstruct the original? No. It doesn't mean we cannot reconstruct the original. The original text is preserved in the family of manuscripts which we have today. And there's a principle that uh, Dr. Kurt Allen made famous called the principle of tenacity. And what that principle basically means is that once a reading enters the text, it's tenacious. That is, it stays there. And this will perpetuate the the existence of, of scribal variants and textual errors in the text because the following scribe comes along and he simply uh, assumes that this is part of the, the, the text, or he doesn't want to change it, or uh, he'll just leave it in there. It's safer to leave it there than to actually take it out. So, how many variants do we have in the New Testament? Well, in terms of words in the New Testament, we have about 140,000 words in the Greek New Testament. How many variants are there? There's about 400,000. Now, of course, this comes as a shock to many people because they think that this is, again, an undermining of the integrity of the New Testament or calling into question whether or not we can trust the New Testament. But many of these variants, an overwhelming majority of these variants, are uh, variants that do not uh, affect the, the reading of the text. Uh, a lot of these uh, variants will include what's known in Greek as a movable new and a, a movable new simply is the, the letter N that appears uh, at the end of, uh, of third-person singular Greek words. And um, some manuscripts will include the N, some will not. Just like the word uh, an apple versus a apple. Uh, and so the moment they see these differences, these include as variants. And that's why you'll notice the, the numbers are very high. But the majority uh, of these, while they, they have to do with variants that do not affect the, the, the meaning of the text, a very small minority of them uh, are, are what would be considered uh, viable or consider, um, considerable when it comes to the text.
And so uh, let, don't let those numbers frighten you. It's, it's very common for people to hear this and, and think that uh, we have no reason to trust the text of the New Testament. So let me just say a little bit about how we've got the, the modern versions that we have today. Um, we have uh, the uh, Latin Vulgate, for one thing, and then we have what's called the Byzantine Tradition, or the Byzantine Manuscripts, and this is where we find the majority text. So 90% of the New Testament texts that we have today are of the Byzantine family. And there's a reason why there's so many of them. Uh, I'll get to that in a minute. And then on the far right, you have the Alexandrian Tradition, or the critical text, as it has been known, or the Westcott Hort text. And the emergence of these various translations, uh, you will notice, for instance, that the King James Version and the New King James Version, both of them come from the Byzantine tradition or the majority text tradition. However, the King James um, is somewhat different because while it does come from the majority text tradition, the King James is based on uh, a, a reading called the Textus Receptus, um, the Textus Receptus is the basis of the King James Version, 1611, and the other editions. And the Textus Receptus does have some unique readings that are not found in the majority text. Um, and so uh, let me just say straight up, as they say. Young people always talk about straight up, tell you straight up. Uh, I'm not King James only. I, rev I love the King James Version. It's a wonderful translation. Uh, I'm not King James only. I don't think John is from uh, reading his posts. He is not King James only, nor would he hold, nor do I hold to the text Receptus as the only uh, source for God's revelation. And then uh, you'll notice that the Latin Vulgate was also used. Uh, the Latin Vulgate was also used as a source uh, for the Textus Receptus. Um, and uh, in fact, the last uh, chapter of Revelation 22, the last six verses, Erasmus, when he was translating the, uh, uh, providing his first uh, uh, publication of the uh, Greek New Testament in 1516, uh, Erasmus did not have uh, a copy of the last six verses of Revelation 22, and so he went to the Vulgate and actually back translated, translated from the Latin into, uh, into Greek, and he ended up with some peculiar readings that are found in no manuscripts today. Uh, and so um, I don't blame the guy. He was in a bit of a hurry. The Pope was kind of rushing him to get that thing published. Uh, and so uh, he, had, uh, he had no recourse but to back-translate from the Latin. So that created some interesting readings. And, of course, the New King James Version uh, will, will also claim it's, it's base to be the text Receptus, but it also includes the majority text and will make in its footnotes references to the critical text. The Alexandrian tradition, the critical text, um, is the foundation for the modern translations of the Bible. So the Nestle Alland, I have a copy of it here on my desk, and also the United Bible Societies. These are Greek New Testaments based on the Alexandrian tradition. And so all the modern translations, like the New American Standard Bible, the NIV, the ESV, and so forth, uh, are, um, are brought out or translated from that text. So I'll get to uh, where I stand on this very shortly. But where, where, what was the majority text during the first millennium? Well, during the first millennium, um, the Alexandrian manuscripts were actually in the majority. The uh, Byzantine manuscripts did not become the majority until the 9th century AD. There's a reason for that. And you'll notice that as we approach the 9th century, the Byzantine manuscripts have um, increased quite considerably. And there's a reason for that, why you have this increase in the Byzantine manuscripts, which is the source of the majority text, and you'll notice that the Alexandrian manuscripts uh, are dwindling. They're beginning to decrease. Now, when we compare them again, if you look at the papyri, the papyri are, are the earliest materials that we have in terms of the New Testament manuscripts. They appear uh, very early. In fact, they are the earliest. One of the reasons why they're very fragmentary is that papyri uh, was very fragile, very brittle. It, it broke very easily. And the reason why any of them survived is because many of them were discovered uh, in the sands of Egypt, in the desert of Egypt. And some of these papyri, believe it or not, were found uh, in, um, in garbage heaps, actually, in a place called Oxyrhynchus in, in Egypt, which is quite interesting, considering the other texts they also found in there. Uh, including uh, Old Testament texts and Latin 
text of the Bible as well. You'll notice that uh, the, green, the, the green there are known as uh, uncials or uncials, and these are capital lettered texts. In the ancient world, in Greek, everyone wrote in large caps. It's like the version of, you know, yelling today and texting and email. Like, hello, everybody, can you hear me? Uh, they would write in uncials, in capitals, and there was no spaces in between. So you had this, this incredible, uh, you know, this, this, this is, you have to take Tylenol before you translate these texts because you have this continuous, scriptal continua, this continuous text, no spaces, no punctuation. So uh, translating was not the easiest thing to do. And so you'll notice that the, the uncials, the, the magiscals, the, the large capital size uh, lettered manuscripts, are pretty dominant there in the 4th century, and then you'll notice that by the time you get to the 10th century, they're in decline. But notice that the minuscules, and this, the majority text is primarily minuscule, that is lowercase uh, text, you'll notice that they start exploding in the, ne- in the, uh, the uh, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th century, and beyond. So, why was there a decline in the writing of the Alexandrian manuscripts? Well, there's a couple of factors we have to consider. Uh, Number one, the destruction of manuscripts in persecution against Christians. For example, the Emperor Diocletian in his first edict in 303 AD called for the destruction of the copies or of scriptures that Christians possessed. So this edict included specific orders commanding the burning of copies of the scriptures, other church books, which resulted in loss of untold number of biblical manuscripts. Um, we also know that it was during this time that, that many Christians died uh, refusing to hand over copies of the scriptures to the Romans. And many of them became what was known as confessors. Uh, they refused to deny the faith. And uh, those who did deny the faith uh, were known as traitors. This caused a huge controversy in the early church, known as the Donatus controversy. We don't have time for that. That's not our topic tonight. Um, and so this was a very critical point in, in church history. Some, some Christians would hand over some, because uh, the Romans didn't know, uh, some of them, a lot of them were illiterate, the, the soldiers, so the Christians would just hand them a, just a copy of a nice little uh, story that uh, they would probably read to their children. The Romans thought they were scriptures, and they would just take them and burn them anyway. They just didn't know the difference. So a lot of these uh, manuscripts were destroyed uh, during the persecution. The churches were to be razed to the ground. And another important factor here, this is very important, is that Latin uh, begins to become the dominant language in the West, supplanting Greek. This is very important to understand. For example, Tertullian, around 200 AD, uh, he writes his works in Latin, not in Greek. And the copies that we have, for instance, of Irenaeus, uh, an early Greek father, uh, the Bishop of Lyon, uh, Irenaeus, uh, his works survive today predominantly in Latin. Uh, and so in the West, Latin uh, begins to take uh, flight, and uh, we have old Latin manuscripts of, of the New Testament that come out of this, and then by the, uh, the end of the 5th century, or middle of the 5th century, Jerome comes and writes the standard Latin Vulgate. And so there's <clears throat> numerous Latin manuscripts in the West. Another significant factor to the decline of the writing of Alexandrian manuscripts was the Islamic expansion into the West. Uh, This is very, very important to understand. Uh, One area in Europe that was shielded from the Islamic expansion or the Islamic invasions was Byzantium until it was eventually conquered by Islam in 1453 when Constantinople was toppled by the Muslim Turks. And this forced the uh, theologians and the scholars in Byzantium to move. And where did they move? They went into the West. And it's interesting that in the providence of God, this destruction of Byzantium in 1453, a year later, Gutenberg's press was uh, created in um, Germany. And this opened the door for uh, the New Testament to eventually be printed by Erasmus. So a lot of these theologians from Byzantium came over into the West and they brought their manuscripts with them. And that's why Erasmus, for instance, could... uh, obtain these, these manuscripts from the Byzantine tradition because a lot of these manuscripts were mi- uh, brought over into Europe by this migration. And so it's important to realize that when you look at the map of Western Europe, you'll notice that in 632, when Muhammad dies, uh, 
um, the Islamic armies begin to march quite rapidly, and they take over all of Arabia in 632 A.D. Um, they take over uh, most of the Middle East by 750 A.D. And you'll notice uh, over here that uh, all of North Africa is taken, and that would include Egypt, Alexandria, uh, Egypt, which was uh, one of the places the Alexandrian manuscripts come from, not the only place. Uh, and so with the advancement of Islam and the destruction of, of most of Christendom uh, in that time period, you can understand why it's not the safest thing to have scriptoriums while Muslims are ruling uh, with Sharia law. Uh, where Christians are dhimmis and subjugated, conquered peoples and so forth. But in Byzantium, you'll notice in Byzantium, Byzantium um, is, is, is insulated there, it's protected. And so in Byzantium, what do you have? You have scriptoriums, you have uh, the production of manuscripts are unfettered, uh, the production of these manuscripts uh, are, are supervised uh, by uh, various um, uh, leaders, abbots, if you will, in the scriptoriums. And therefore, you have this explosion of, of manuscripts in numbers. And that's why it's called the majority text, because there's so many of them. Uh, but in the West, when Islam was ruling, uh, it was a very unsafe thing to do, to be reading your Bible openly and, and to be uh, selling your Bible or handing out copies of your Bible. Just take today Saudi Arabia as a prime example, where you cannot even take a Bible or any religious text into Saudi Arabia without facing uh, a, a, some form of persecution or imprisonment uh, or deportation. And so we can see why the Alexandrian manuscripts diminished with the advent of uh, Islam, but also the supplanting of Latin as the language of the Western Church, uh, where Greek remained uh, in Byzantium. And to this day, the Byzantium text tradition is the official text of the, or the Eastern Orthodox Church for obvious reasons. So reconstructing the New Testament, none of the textual variants in the manuscripts of the New Testament affect or deny any fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith. None of the different manuscripts in the Alexandrian, Western, and Byzantium families affect or deny any fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith. Maurice Robinson, a Byzantium priority scholar, has admitted that. Uh, my position is known as reasoned eclecticism. What does that mean? We examine all the readings in the manuscript families. We accept the ones that best qualify as the original reading. So am I against the majority text? No, I'm not. I believe that it has a place at the table. However, the critical text, in my opinion, is much earlier than the majority text and so much closer to the time of Jesus and the early church. For the first 300 years of the history of the church, all the church fathers quoted from the Alexandrian text type manuscripts not from the Byzantium text type manuscripts, at least not until about 350 with uh, John Chrysostom. So, does the majority always rule? It does not logically follow that the majority is always right in every case. In some cases, when it comes to voting, it is in democracy. But it does, it's not always right. Uh, would a basket of 100 rotten bananas be more valuable than a basket of 10 ripe bananas? Well, obviously not. We also have the argumentum at populum. This is a fallacy in logic that basically says that if the majority believes something, it must be true. Well, that is a, a fallacy because the majority can be wrong. And in fact, uh, if you were living in Nazi Germany during the Second World War, the majority of Germany agreed with the Nazis. And so based on, on, on an argument for majority, we would have to conclude the Nazis were right. Of course not. That's not true. There was only one copy of God's word, for instance, that was found in the days of Josiah, 2 Kings 22, verse 8. When they found the word of the Lord, you'll notice Josiah read from it, the, high, the, the, the prophet Hilkiah read from it, and what did that do? It brought national revival and repentance. God usually works with the small remnant sometimes, not always the majority. Majority text does not approach a uniform text. Maurice Robinson openly admits this. We don't have a uniform text. The majority text suffers textual corruption as well, uh, like the critical text and all manuscripts of the New Testament. And so arguments for the majority text, while applicable to the New Testament or to the criticism of the New Testament, it will not work with the Old Testament, folks. Old Testament criticism is a different kind of bird, uh, and it is very different from the New Testament. So uh, if we were to apply the same criterion uh, that we apply to the New Testament in terms of the majority readings or the majority text, we would have serious problems if we applied 
the same standard to the Old Testament because the Old Testament, its textual tradition uh, is different. And so let me reiterate that while I hold that the critical text is, is older and closer to uh, the first century, to the time of Christ and the early church, uh, I do believe that uh, the Byzantium or majority text does have a place at the table. There are readings that are better in the majority text, and uh, the uh, critical text will adopt them. In fact, they do adopt those texts uh, and insert them because they're based on better uh, evidence than, than not. And so I thank you for your time, and I hope that uh, you will uh, take to heart and uh, what I've said, and I hope this will generate some interesting questions. Thank you so much. And now we'll give the time to John Torres, and we'll just give a couple minutes to, or not a couple minutes, maybe a few seconds for uh, him to set up the uh, station over here, and we'll do the switch. Thank you. <laughs> Ready? All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. Uh, we are discussing an esoteric topic, textual criticism. Uh, many Christians haven't even heard of this topic, and of those who have, many consider it not to be particularly important. I assure you that it is. I should like to begin by emphasizing three points before I begin my presentation proper. Uh, first, as Tony mentioned, this is not about the best English translation of the New Testament. It is about the original Greek text. God inspired the New Testament writings in the first century, D in Koine Greek, and for about 1,400 years, until the printing press was invented, the only way to make more copies of the New Testament was to copy the books by hand. Today we have about 5,800 of these hand-copied manuscripts, but as Tony pointed out, probably no two are exactly identical. The scribes who copied them were not perfect, and they made mistakes. Copies of their copies would keep the mistakes they made and add new ones. And until today, there are some 200 to 400,000 differences or variants spread among those 5,800 manuscripts. There are numerous places in the New Testament where some manuscripts read one thing and manuscripts read something else. How do we decide which readings are the original readings breathed out by God? That, folks, is purpose of textual criticism. It's the art and science of comparing and assessing the variants at each point of difference in the extant manuscript to try to determine which reading was in the original text. Uh, the goal is to assemble a Greek text that is as close as possible to the original. Scott McKnight puts it this way, the science of determining as far as possible the original text of the New Testament. There are essentially two different methods or approaches uh, doing this. There is the one that Tony mentioned, recent eclecticism, and there is the majority reading approach. Whichever method you use, this will be 85% identical. Technically, there's only one Greek text, and what we mean by different Greek texts is how that other 15% is filled in from the manuscripts. And this 15% will have differences based on which method you use, and some of those differences will be reflected in the English translations. And this brings us to the subject of our debate tonight. Uh, Tony, as he said, uh, by reasoned eclecticism, and I swear by different method, the majority text approach. And of course, the Greek text that we will see as closest to the original will be different as well. Reason eclecticism, Tony's approach is this. It is the one used by almost all scholars. It results in the Greek New Testament text that we find in the current edition of the Nestle Alland Novum Testamentum Graeca, it's this one, 
This Greek text is the one that is used for the New Testament translations of almost all major modern translations, including your NIV, NASB, ESV, HCSB, RSV, NRSV, and the NLT. Enough there to make alphabet soup. The majority reading approach, used by a very small minority of scholars today, uh, Dr. Maurice Robinson, Tony mentioned him, Dr. Wilbur Pickering, a few others, not many. It results in the Greek New Testament text found in the New Testament, in the original Greek Byzantine text form, 2005, and the Greek New Testament according to the majority text. The second thing I'd like to draw your attention to before I begin my presentation proper, this has been billed in-house debate, and that is what it is. Uh, this is a discussion between Christians. Tony and I are both Christians, both evangelicals. Uh, we both love the Lord. We both love his word. We both believe the Bible is the inerrant, infallible word of God. We both recognize its fundamental importance for Christian doctrine and practice. And we both agree that our English New Testaments should represent as closely as possible the exact original Greek New Testament. The only issue here that we disagree on is how to determine that original text and what that resulting text is. We are both acting in good faith out of our desire to serve God in this matter. The third and final thing I want to draw your attention to before my presentation is this. Does it matter? Is it important? <laughs> Does it matter? Is it important? Virtually all of the Christians who know what textual criticism think it does not matter, and perhaps a debate like this is pointless, because they see things like this. The text of the Bible is 99.5% settled. The differences are trivial. No doctrine of the faith is affected by any choice of variant. So no, it doesn't matter. But that is not true. In fact, there are more than 6,500 differences between this and this. 6,500. Every six verses you go through, you will find five differences. And certainly many of them are trivial. Many of them are trivial if losing content is trivial. Not all of them. In some cases, depending on which variants are chosen to be the originals, there will be errors of fact and science in the Bible. We will obscure theology. We will lose theology. We will even have theological error. There are places where the Bible will be made to look silly. Jesus will be made to look bad. We will help skeptics undermine the resurrection and the gospel books. I have time only for a few examples. My time is limited. But just to give you examples. Mark chapter 1, verse 2. As it is written in the prophets or as it is written in Isaiah the prophet? It makes a difference because the next line doesn't come from Isaiah. It comes from Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Right after that is a quote from Isaiah 40, verse 3. So if Mark wrote, as it is written in the prophets, he is correct. If he wrote, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, he is not correct. Behold, I send my messenger before your face will prepare your way before you is not written in Isaiah the prophet. Does Luke 23, 45 say then the sun was darkened or does it say then the sun was eclipsed? The majority text says darkened. This Nestle Island says eclipsed. Could it be eclipsed? Happened at Passover, time of the full moon. A solar eclipse is impossible at the time of the full moon. Scientific error. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Does it say God was manifested in the flesh, as in the majority text? Or does it say who was manifested in the flesh, as in the Nestle Allon? Okay. This is a great proof text for the deity of Christ. It disappears if we have who and not God. Who is grammatical nonsense because you have a relative pronoun then with no antecedent. And it also makes the text look silly. Great is the mystery of godliness who was manifested in the flesh. What is mysterious about a human being being manifested in the flesh? John 7, 8. 
The majority text, Jesus speaking to his brothers, tells them, I am not yet going up to this feast. Then later his brothers go, and he goes. No problem, he said, not yet, going later. But in the Nestle Island, we have, I am not going up to this feast. But after his brothers went up, then he went up secretly. Doesn't make Jesus look very honest there, does it? Interestingly, this particular absence of yet, this will not mean anything to you at this point, but it would to Tony, yet is actually present in P66, in P75, and in Vaticanus. Yet for some reason, the critical text editors left it out. This is just a very few examples. There are many, many more. And so, I'm sorry, at least one doctrine of the faith is affected by this. Inerrancy. If there are errors in the Bible, the doctrine of inerrancy is gone. So I trust you see now why the issue, oops, why the issue of textual criticism is important. It is essential to know which method of textual criticism will give us the original text of the New Testament. So now that is what we will look at. Let us go on to look at these two methods and see if we can figure out which one is correct. We begin with the dominant mainstream approach, reasoned eclecticism. How does it recover the original texts of the New Testament? Fundamentally, it is built on five pillars that developed across centuries. There's not enough time to go through their historical development in detail, so I will just present and explain them briefly in a simplified form. These five are the division into text types of the manuscripts, Griesbach's canons, Codex Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, Westcott and Hort's genealogical method, and the New Testament papyri. First, the idea of text types. We have 5,800 manuscripts. But going back into 1734, scholars thought, you know what, we shouldn't look at the manuscripts as individuals. We can group them according to shared characteristics, shared characteristics of the families, and they group them into what are now three types, the Alexandrian, the Western, and the Byzantine text types based on their shared characteristics. The idea being that each family came from an original archetype that came sometime after the original. And so instead of looking at which is the best manuscript, the focus became which is the best text type. Now, it's not really equal. Most of them, as Tony said, most of them are Byzantine. Anyway, 95 to 98 percent of manuscripts are Byzantine. Not more than a few dozen are actually Alexandrian, if that many, and the Western has even fewer than that. Okay? Text types, the first one. The second one was the canons or rules of textual criticism. In 1796, a German rationalist scholar named Johann Jakob Griesbach published a list of 15 rules or canons for choosing among variant readings. Wherever you see two different readings at the same point in two different manuscripts or two different families, how do you decide which is the original? Well, you follow the rules. There's a lot of overlap in the 15 rules, but it boiled down to these four canons, and they are still the ones follow today, and are integral to reasoned eclecticism. Number one, the shorter readings to be preferred. If you have a choice between two readings, one is longer, one is shorter, take the shorter. Why? Because scribes were much more prone to add than to omit. Second rule, the more difficult reading is to be preferred. If you have a choice between one reading that's easy, it agrees with theology, it has no error, and one that's difficult, one that causes a problem, take the more difficult one. The more difficult one must have been original. Why? Because scribes were prone to correct errors. Okay, as Griesbach said, that reading is rightly considered suspect that manifestly gives the dogmas of the Orthodox better than the others. Okay. Number three, the reading that differs from quoted or parallel material is to be preferred. Why? Scribes were prone to harmonize discordant passages. 
And for the reading that best explains the origin of the others, according to these canons, is to be preferred. Okay. According to these canons, if you looked at the differences in readings between Alexandrian and Byzantine, Alexandrian seemed to be better. And the Alexandrian manuscripts are, in fact, what this is based on, the Nestle Alon Greek text. The third step was the discovery in the second half of the 19th century of two ancient manuscripts of the New Testament. These are just one page from each of them, Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. These dated to the 4th century, as much as 100 years older than the oldest manuscript we had at that time. They were classed as Alexandrian, and they were hailed as the most reliable early manuscripts of the New Testament. And they became the core, again, of the Nestle Alon Greek text, and remain so today. That's why, depending on the Bible you use, you'll see notes like this in your Bible. When you're reading Mark chapter 16, at the end of verse 8, you'll see a note like this. The most reliable early manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have Mark 16, 9 to 20. And why is that? Because Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus both end Mark at verse 8 of chapter 16. There's a problem here, though. These manuscripts really aren't the most reliable. They aren't really reliable at all. Hermann Hosker, a scholar in the early 20th century, did a detailed examination and comparison of these two manuscripts. It's published in 1914 in London by Bernard Corich. It's available online for anybody who's interested. He was going to go through the entire New Testament he didn't make it past the end of the gospel books because there just was too much. Hoskier, after filling 450 pages with a detailed and careful discussion of the errors in Codex Vaticanus and another 400 on the idiosyncrasies of Codex Sinaiticus, affirms that in the gospels alone, those two manuscripts differ well over 3,000 times. And that doesn't include minor errors like spelling and synonym substitution. Over 3,000 times in the gospel books alone means that what? Every five verses you read, they will disagree with each other four times. They disagree more than they agree with each other. So how could they possibly be good witnesses to anything, let alone to the original Greek text? They can't. The fourth pillar was Westcott and Hort. Genealogical method was their main contribution. At this time, 1881, the Textus Receptus, which was based on Byzantine manuscripts, was still hanging on as the text of choice because people just could not wrap their heads around the idea that 98% of the manuscripts were wrong. It didn't seem reasonable to think that the true text was actually only in a small handful. The overwhelming majority should rule. But Westcott and Hort overturned this through their major contribution, the genealogical method. It went like this. Oh, man, I keep pushing this. Yeah. You got six manuscripts there of Mark chapter 1. And one, two, three, four, five of them say the prophets. One says Isaiah the prophet. Five witnesses against one. Who should win? But wait, said Westcott and Hort. Just suppose... Those five all were copied from the same one manuscript. It's not really five against one, it's one against one. The majority really shouldn't determine things. We have thereby passed beyond purely numerical relations and the necessity of examining the genealogy of both minority and majority has become apparent. We have to look at who, what was copied from what. And that theoretical demonstration fled finally to the overthrow of the Byzantine text. Should be noted it was overthrown under false pretenses, though. Westcott and Hort never actually examined the genealogy of any real New Testament manuscript to show that the Byzantine manuscripts should be considered to be representatives of only a few earlier manuscripts. And it can't be done. We simply do not have enough 
manuscripts left to put together a genuine genealogical tree. All they did say was, well, it could have happened that way, which really shouldn't have carried weight at all, and yet it did. The Byzantine text was overthrown. The fifth pillar was the discovery of the New Testament papyri. There's examples of three of them on the uh, screen there. Starting in 1889, archaeologists found numerous of these New Testament papyri, manuscripts written on papyrus in Egypt. Uh, They were much older than anything we had before. Some of them went back into the second and third centuries. And what text types were they? These new oldest manuscripts? Well, here's what you will hear. James White, for example, every one of the papyrus manuscripts we have discovered has been a representative of the Alexandrian, not the Byzantine text type. Every text type is apparently found in the papyri except the Byzantine, Daniel Wallace. So the case would seem to be closed. The Alexandrian text is the closest to the original. Their variants should be favored, but adjudicated according to those canons. Reasoned eclecticism is correct. The Byzantine can essentially be ignored, and the majority reading approach is wrong. Again, there's a case, all those five pillars. It all seems so convincing, so unassailable, so right. But is it? Or is it a house built on sand that should have collapsed long ago? Yes, indeed. When we look at the evidence carefully, a very different picture will emerge. Now, we've already seen that number three, that doesn't really hold water, nor does number four. What about one, two, and five? Do you see anywhere here a linchpin, one claim on which the entire case fundamentally rests? There is one. It's there, number two, Griesbach's canons. Let's look at his canons again. What fundamental assumption underlies each of these canons? Do you see it? Scribes were much more prone to add than to omit. Scribes were prone to correct errors. Scribes were prone to harmonize. The assumption, the linchpin that underlies all of this is that scribes freely took it upon themselves to alter the text of Scripture that they were copying. All modern textual criticism rests on that assumption. You pick up any book, you look at Metzger's textual commentary, any discussion of variants, that is always in the forefront. Do understand the significance of that. If that assumption is not true, the rules are not just wrong, they are backwards. And the entire reasoned methodology, the basis for the Nestle Island, will collapse. Now, we have to ask then, since we're going evidence-based. Where did this assumption come from? Where did Griesbach get this idea? Now remember, I mentioned he's a rationalist. What does that mean? Rationalists believe that all true knowledge comes from the rational cogitation of the mind. You find it out through the reasoning. You don't need to look at sensory data. It's untrustworthy. Griesbach did not look at scribal habits to discover what they did. He proclaimed what they did on the basis of what seemed reasonable to him, and this has been accepted for 200 years as axiomatic. What is conspicuously absent is people asking, how do you know what is your evidence? This is supposed to be a science, folks. It has to be evidence-based. How do we determine whether scribes actually freely took it upon themselves to alter the text? Well, there are two things we can look at. First, we could look at their self-testimony, and second, we could look at actual scribal habits as shown through studying the manuscripts themselves. Now, regarding uh, self-testimony, Dr. Michael Kruger, professor of New Testament and early Christianity at Reformed Theological Seminary in Charlotte, did a survey, and he found the following. Very interesting. One area that has been largely overlooked is the attitude toward that text that is actually expressed by Christians in the early literary sources, statements about how they would have viewed their writings, sacred writings, and the transmission, how they would have responded to changes or alterations in the text. Isn't that fascinating? For 200 years, 
we accepted the claim that scribes freely changed the text without ever bothering to check whether they actually would do that or not. Okay. Kruger goes on to show, uh, point out from the New Testament, a couple of Now, as Kruger goes on to point out, if Christians viewed their sacred books as scripture, we would expect the same sort of practice of reproduction that they did with the Old Testament. And he shows that they did. He shows from 1 Timothy 5.18, 2 Peter 3.50-16, and quotes from early church fathers that they viewed the scripture as the New Testament books as scripture. They were not adding or taking away. That principle, what they called an inscriptional curse, was reaffirmed and applied by early Christians to the New Testament writings. Uh, He shows this in uh, the Dache in 100, Polycarp and Dionysius of Corinth in 170, denouncing every time church fathers address this, they're denouncing those who would change scripture. Irenaeus 1, 80, there shall be no light punishment inflicted upon him who either adds or subtracts anything from the scripture. The church doctrine is being guarded and preserved without any forging of scriptures, neither receiving addition nor suffering curtailment. Okay. That's the self testament They didn't do it. They found that. doesn't mean it was never done, but it would have been very much a minority thing, and it would have been corrected by the leaders. Then it was not until the 20th century that we began to look at actual scribal habits, studying what they did. Torelli, Caldwell, PM Head, this book, the latest, over a thousand, almost a thousand pages long. Every study on scribal habits found that deliberate alterations were very rare. The most common scribal error by far was accidental omission. And that then confirms, conforms perfectly with what Kruger found. Scribes, Christian scribes, did not take it upon themselves to change the text. We now have two independent lines of evidence confirming that scribes did not freely alter the text and hard evidence that, in fact, that most mistakes were accidental, omissions were the most common. And what that means then is these rules are backwards. If accidental omission is the most common, the longer reading should be preferred. The less difficult reading should be preferred. The harmonized reading should be preferred. The other fact that drives a nail into the coffin of Nestle Alon is the papyri. Now these are supposed to support the Alexandrian. Remember, this was the claim. This was the claim. They're all Alexandrian. There's no Byzantine. It's not true. Okay? The characteristics of the New Testament papyri, what was expected was that they would be Alexandrian. What was found was that it was a mix of all different types, not classifiable according to the traditional text types. Uh, for example, rather than lining up in clear streams or text types, the earliest manuscripts are dotted helter-skelter over a wide spectrum of variation. For example, P66 is not fully Alexandrian, nor fully Western, nor fully Byzantine. Scholars are hard-pressed to give P66 a fitting label. Philip Comfort, early manuscripts and modern translations of the New Testament. Klein did a comparison of the early manuscripts to representative uh, Alexandrian manuscripts, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, where those two disagreed with each other. What did P66 agree with? 14 times with Sinaiticus, 20 times with Vaticanus, 33 times with the Textus Receptus. P75, 9 times with Sinaiticus, 33 times with Vaticanus, 29 times with uh, Textus Receptus. You couldn't really pigeonhole these papyri into any one of these groups. It was expected there would be absolutely no Byzantine readings, especially no longer readings, no conflict readings. What was found was at least 150 distinctively Byzantine readings, including longer ones and conflict readings. Harry Sturtz. David Stutz did his PhD thesis on comparing the five earliest papyri of the Gospel according to Matthew, according to all variants and significant variants, against a representative Alexandrian, a representative Byzantine, against Textus Receptus. Uh, 
It's interesting that in four out of five cases, the Byzantine is closer to P77 than, is, than it is to the Alexandrian. Same thing with the Textus Receptus. It's actually closer. Okay? What is the significance of this? Well, it's quite startling, but this comes from Dr. Kurt Allon, the 20th century Dorian of textual criticism, and the guy who actually edited this one. He said, the New Testament manuscripts of the 2nd and 3rd centuries have a mixed text, clearly existed before recensions were made. This is the best argument against the existence of any text types, including the Alexandrian and the Byzantine. We still live in the world of Westcott and Hort with our conception of different recensions and text types. We can no longer take their conception as valid. Okay, that's what he says. So reason eclecticism, folks, is dead. The Nestle Allant is dead. They don't want to admit it, but it is. How do we find the true text? Well, what are we left with at this point? We have about 5,800 New Testament manuscripts, each of which must now be considered to be an independent witness to the original text of the New Testament. We cannot no longer treat them as members of a text type. And even if you wanted to, we have not found parent-child relationships among the manuscripts. I think a total of two only. So, like it or not, they are all independent witnesses to the original text of the New Testament. Secondly, we know that the vast majority of mistakes were unintentional. They were not done deliberately. So, we have a large data set in random errors. What does that lead us to? Remember this, it's supposed to be science. We have to apply scientific data handling to the matter, specifically statistical analysis. Now, normally, biblical scholars recoil at this in horror. It's out of their field of expertise. So they either don't want to go there or they don't understand the strength of this approach. Nevertheless, we have a large data set with random errors. Statistical analysis is the way to go. Now first, okay, we need some probabilities. How do we figure out what are the chances that a scribe would unintentionally make a mistake? Okay. Well, unlike Griesbach, we look at real data. We'll look at P66. It's probably the, the most error-ridden New Testament manuscript in the world. It has 482 singular readings, 400 idicisms, 54 forward leaves, 22 back leaves. It has a mistake every 16 words. It would be like you copying out the Gospel according to Matthew and making over 1,000 mistakes. Okay. Let's assume an even higher rate. Let's say scribes would make a mistake once every 10 words. Okay. Now, and let's assume then of that autograph that uh, Tony mentioned, only five copies were made of that original autograph. How many copies would an error have to infect for it ever to take majority status? It would have to infect at least three, wouldn't it? Right? What are the chances of having a an error at any one point in one manuscript? One in ten, right? We said one every ten words. So chances one in ten to have it in the second manuscript in the same word. One in ten. Now there, in the third manuscript, one in ten. The chances of that happening is one in a thousand. You think that's bad? Look at the next generation. Five copies from each of those five. To enter an error at this point, you would have to get it into 13 copies. Okay? That's one in 10 trillion, folks. It's not going to happen. It's absolutely not going to happen. And this is real science. Okay? If we go back to that first generation, we said one in a thousand, but that's only having an error at a particular word. It would have to be the same error. Okay? There's four broad categories of error. Okay? There's addition, omission, substitution, transposition. So then it's actually one quarter times one in ten times, one quarter times one. One in uh, two million, 560,000. Not going to happen. Okay, it's absolutely not going to happen. And this is based on real life numbers. Okay? And with numbers, we chose to be as generous as possible to the chances of getting wrong readings into the majority. Now, if you cannot get a wrong reading into, into majority status, what does that mean? That means when you look at the manuscripts, any reading, at any point of variation, whatever is in the majority of manuscripts at that point, particularly large majority, has to be the original. Has to be. So we can recover the entire text, original text of the New Testament. We don't have to settle for coming only close, as a lot of textual critics say. You look at the manuscripts not as a whole, but you look at the readings, and in each case, you take the reading that is found in the majority of the manuscripts. 
that is the majority reading approach, folks. It is the one that is in keeping with the actual evidence. It is the one that respects the fact that scribes did not take it upon themselves to alter the text. And think about it. These people gave their lives to serve Christ. They gave their lives to protect Scripture. You wouldn't change Scripture. Why would you think they would? They didn't. That's the evidence. They didn't change it. Changes were accidental. What does that take us to then? The majority reading approach. Okay. And you know what happens then? Those errors we talked about before, errors of science, errors of uh, fact, making Jesus look stupid, surprise, they all disappear. Not because we have picked a methodology to make them disappear, but because the Bible is the word of God, which means when we look at the evidence properly, it will be inerrant, and it is. No surprise there. Thank you. Isaiah 40, verse 3. The emphasis there is on the desert and salvation coming to the people of God. Now, of course, uh, John is going to say, aha, but you see, you still have the mention of the prophet Isaiah. Now, was this common in, in the first century? Yes, it was. And in fact, when we look at Matthew 27, verse 9, we some, see something very interesting. Speaking about the betrayal of Jesus by Judas, it says, then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel. Now, you could seek all through Jeremiah, do a Bible gateway search on Jeremiah. You will never find a reference to the 30 pieces of silver found in the book of the prophet Jeremiah. Nowhere. And yet, what does Matthew do? He says, this was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. Now, notice that later manuscripts of the Byzantine family, saw the problem. Now, John says that uh, scribes really didn't change uh, the text, but later manuscripts add the word Zechariah. The scribes saw a problem here because uh, Jeremiah is being cited, but the text that mentions the 30 pieces of silver is actually found in Zechariah chapter 11. And this is what prompted some scribes to change the name Jeremiah to Zechariah. So Codex 22, for instance, has Zechariah. And that is a majority text manuscript. Family 33, which is also majority text, omits the prophet's name altogether. It just deletes the name Jeremiah to avoid the problem. And then Codex 21, another minuscule manuscript, and some Latin manuscripts, even changed the prophet's name to Isaiah. Now, why would they do that? Unless they thought that Isaiah was the prominent prophet in the New Testament. He's quoted the most among the prophets. Now, what is interesting is, notice in bold I, I've uh, highlighted, then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, tote epledothi, torithen dia yermio to profetu legontes, Compare that with Matthew 1, 22 to 23. The wording is identical. In Matthew 1, verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, and he quotes Isaiah 7, 14. Notice in the Greek, Pleidothi torithen hupokulio diato profito legantes is virtually word for word the same as Matthew 27, 9. In other words, this is a quotation. It's alerting the reader that this is a quotation, and he ascribes it to the prophet Jeremiah. And so if Mark can apply a reading from Exodus 23:20, 20, Malachi 3, 1, uh, to Isaiah, then Matthew also can apply a reading from the prophet Zechariah where the 30 shekels of silver I mentioned to Jeremiah. Because the emphasis in the prophecy there is on the potter's field. And so I think it's important that we bear that in mind. And scribes changed it because they found that there was a difficulty in the reading. It was a harder reading, so they changed it. Now, John was saying about the difficult reading that it's actually the simpler reading that should be preferred, but according to that reasoning, Acts 20:28, 20, where Paul says that uh, you should shepherd the flock of God, 
uh, the Holy Spirit has made you elders over the flock of God, over the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Well, later manuscripts say the church of the Lord. And some even expanded to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ because obviously some scribes had some issues with the idea that God had blood. The church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Which is the harder reading, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood, or the church of the Lord, which he purchased? Well, obviously the church of God is a much harder reading. And that's the reading in the Textus Receptus. But you'll notice that there are manuscripts, minuscule manuscripts that come later that actually change the wording of Acts 20.28. 20, now, the other thing that we have to uh, bear in mind um, is that I think John may be confusing Byzantine readings with the Byzantine text type. I, didn't, I never said that there are no Byzantine readings in the Alexandrian manuscripts. That has never been denied, as far as I could tell, by New Testament scholars. Because as I pointed out, Philippians 1.14, we do have a Byzantine reading there that we find in the majority text, but is not in the uh, critical text. And so I think a, a very important distinction has to be made between the Byzantine text type, which is uh, geographically located and so forth, and Byzantine readings, um, two different things all together. Now, John said that uh, there are mistakes in the majority text. And when we look at Griesbach's canons, when he talks about that the shorter reading is to be preferred to the longer reading, take, for example, harmonizations. If you look at the Lord's Prayer, uh, as we find it in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, and you compare it with Luke, chapter 11, you'll notice that in Luke, chapter 11, we have a shorter version of the Lord's Prayer in the earliest manuscripts that we have of Luke and when compared with Matthew. And it's interesting that when we look at the majority text, we notice that the Lord's Prayer in Luke 11 has expanded to match the Lord's Prayer in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, if you were part of a liturgical church and every Sunday you heard the Lord's Prayer being uttered, and in some churches the Lord's Prayer is uttered, usually at the end of the service or after communion, if you're used to uh, saying the Lord's Prayer Sunday after Sunday and you are translating a manuscript and you come to the Lord's Prayer and and it's, and it's a short version, it's a truncated version, well, the tendency is to do what? Well, uh, something's, just, something's a bit off here. Uh, this is not the Lord's Prayer as we, as we utter it Sunday after Sunday. And so in the later manuscripts, you'll notice that the Lord's Prayer in the Gospel of Luke is exactly the same as the Gospel of Matthew, with the doxology added to the end. For thine is the kingdom, uh, the glory, and the power, and so forth. So you see, folks, what we're noticing here is that when you come to these manuscripts, now John mentioned Papyrus 66, and he talked about the mistakes that we find in there that scholars have found. There's a difference. Remember in my opening statement I mentioned that there's a difference between writing scripture in a controlled environment where you have a scriptorium, where you have controlled, uh, or, there's order, there, there's, there's a controlled setting, and so forth, and being on the run, writing copies of scripture while some sweaty Roman is looking for you to kill you. And so when you see the writing in these early papyri, you'll notice they're not as, compare that with the Byzantium manuscripts, or even Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus, they, they even have calligraphy. They, they have art in, in, in these manuscripts. And that's because they're safe and sound in their scriptoriums. But you see, if you're on the run, and, and I have a copy here of Second Peter, and I want to copy this for my, my brothers and sisters in the church, and, and I'm not very well educated. Some of these early Christians, folks, what did Paul say in 1 Corinthians 1? Many of, you, uh, many of you are not known to be, very, to be wise. These were not scholars in the early church. Most of these were slaves. And many of them were illiterate. And so when you read these early papyri, you could see that you're not dealing with a sophisticated text. You're not dealing with people who are sophisticated in their writing. And that's because most of the time these folks were under persecution. But you see, God has been faithful through the ages. God has been 
faithful in preserving his word for his people. And so, can you imagine, in Alexander, Egypt, for the first 350 years, what did the people of God have there? What did they use as their scripture? And then when Latin took over and became the dominant language of the church in the West, and the Latin Vulgate became basically the textus receptus of the Western church, did God use the Latin Vulgate to bring his people to revive? Did God use the Latin Vulgate to change the heart of Johannes Hus? To change the heart of, of John Wycliffe, who only had the Latin Vulgate? based on Western readings and Alexandrian readings, when we see how God has used for 1,100 years, God used the Latin Vulgate. And then God also used the King James Version. God used the King James Version to bring a revival to England and the known world as it became the dominant English translation of the English world. And how many people have I met who, who have come to faith? They've read the King James Version. God touched their heart. God spoke to them, changed them. Others read the NIV. Others read the New American Standard Bible, or the one I use, the ESV, the Evangelical Standard Version. And God has used the ESV to bring people to faith. The voice of the Master can be heard. God is changing the lives of these people. And so my approach to, to this whole topic, folks, uh, is not as adversarial as John's. John has a very adversarial approach to the critical text, to the Alexandrian text, and, and that what rules at the end of the day is the majority rule. But that's not going to work, folks, if you apply that standard to the Old Testament. You're going to get into big trouble with the Old Testament because the Old Testament uh, does not function on a, on a majority rule basis, especially the way the New Testament writers quote from the Old Testament. And the other problem is that the majority is not always right. It's not always right. And so I think it's important um, that we, we bear that in mind. And so I can understand why we're going to find these, these problems in the papyri and in the early manuscripts. John also talked about um, that uh, these, these scholars uh, were not known to the late. Well, we have a reading in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus says that unless you take up your cross daily and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. In the Byzantine manuscripts, they deleted that phrase daily so that Luke and Mark would, excuse me, Matthew and Mark would agree with Luke on that quote. There are examples of deletions. There are examples of corrections to the text. We even find, I believe it's in Codex, I believe it's either Vaticanus or Sinaiticus, there's even a, a, a scribal remark by one scribe who said, leave the text as, as it is, you knave, and don't change it. And so there are examples, folks, of changes in the text. But that's what we would expect if we're looking at these manuscripts. And so I think that the idea that the majority should rule, I think, is a very dangerous one. Because the majority is not always right. So uh, a book that I would like to recommend and um, I think would be very helpful is the text of the New Testament, its transmission, corruption, and restoration, written by Bruce Metzger. This is now the, the fourth edition, and it has been co-edited by Bart Ehrman. Yes, I know uh, the book should be blowing into fire right now as I speak. Uh, but Bart Ehrman uh, simply edited uh, the, the fourth edition under the guidance of uh, Bruce Metzger and so forth. And so um, if you are interested in this, because John and I can speak to you guys all about textual criticism, we can talk about reason eclecticism, we can talk about uh, Texas Receptus, we can talk about Byzantine priority and the majority tax, on and on and on we go. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's up to you to check out the evidence for yourself. As I pointed out from the beginning, this is a very complex subject. This is a very complex area. Um, and so we believe that the original writings are inerrant. We believe that the original writings are the word of God. We believe that we have to defend the word of God. That's what I'm gonna be doing in about two weeks, folks. I'm gonna be in Maple in a mosque debating with a Muslim.
on their home turf defending the Trinity. And I would not be doing that if I didn't believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. I wouldn't be doing that if I didn't believe that the word that we have in our hands today is the word of God. Because you know what my Muslim friends tell me? My Muslim friends tell me that uh, all those variants that you have in your Bible is proof that the Bible is not reliable and that the Bible is not the Word of God. And of course, I turn the tables and say, well, all the variants you have in your Quran show that the Quran is not the Word of God. But the fact of the matter is, folks, we have to deal with the issues. And that's why I appreciate the fact that we have opened the floor to this type of discussion. I appreciate the fact that John is here with me tonight to discuss these issues because these issues do matter. Now, uh, John has, had said that uh, these issues really do matter. Uh, it, it does matter at the end of the day. But again, um, there's nothing that I've seen so far in our discussion tonight that calls into question any of the central doctrines of the Christian faith. Does the modern uh, translations of the Bible uh, contradict, deny the Trinity? Do they deny the deity of Christ? Do they deny salvation by grace alone? Do they deny the bodily resurrection of Christ from the dead? I mean, we can get into the common Johannium, but John doesn't believe it's original, and I don't believe it's original. That's the first John 5, 7 passage, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So the majority text advocates don't believe that that is original, that that's part of scripture. And for the obvious reasons that it doesn't appear uh, until the 16th century in the Greek, uh, a Greek manuscript of the 16th century. So uh, I'm glad that we're having these discussions, and I'm glad that we are engaging these things, because these, uh, these questions are important. And this is why we have to be always ready to give an answer to those of us who ask about the hope that we have in us. And that hope is the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you very much. You sure it's on? Okay. All right. Uh, 20 minutes to answer. I found Tony's response. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I found his, his answer is, uh, quite interesting because they seem to show me two things. One, perhaps I wasn't quite clear in what I was saying, but also an awful lot of what he said actually proved my point. And that may sound arrogant, but uh, one of the points I made in the majority reading approach. You look at the, in each point of variation, you take the reading that is in the majority of the manuscripts. Nobody's saying the Byzantine manuscripts are all correct or they're all identical. Of course they differ from one another. Not nearly as much as the Alexandrians do, not nearly as much as well, the Western does. They did, every scribe made mistakes. The Byzantine manuscripts are generally well done, fewer mistakes, but yeah, they're variants. That's why the majority text takes the reading at each point that is in the majority of manuscripts. Okay? So to say that the Byzantine manuscripts had some mistakes, sure they did. It doesn't change the approach on the majority of readings. Okay? What Tony did was to show there were places where scribes did make intentional changes. Now you recall that I said it was frowned upon. And I said it happens, but not so often, and the leaders would be against it. Uh, Tony quoted that part about fool and knave leave the old reading alone, which is found in Codex Vaticanus, actually, in Hebrews. Uh, yeah, that's the point. They leave the old reading alone. People, the, the leaders, they were not in favor of it. So when he says, well, they changed uh, Matthew 27, 9. They changed uh, Jeremiah to Zechariah. How many manuscripts did that? Nestle Alon critical text lists one. Every one of these changes that seem to be intentional only ever are in a very, very few manuscripts, which proves my point. It was done, but it was rare. It was a minority thing. People didn't accept it. It never got into the majority of manuscripts. Yeah. Uh, if in Philippians 3, the majority text may have a shorter reading. Well, yes, it does. But again, if it's in the majority of manuscripts, our reading would say that's the correct one. The fact that, well, we should generally prefer the longer one, more often than not, the longer is correct. Sometimes the majority is shorter, but we're not dependent on those rules. We're dependent on what is in the majority of manuscripts. The, the, the rules are not always observed, but the rules were made up, 
on a predication that simply is not true. Uh, Mark 1, 2, that, that's interesting. Tony said that it actually included Exodus 22. Maybe, did it? Was Moses a prophet? Yes. Remember, God said that I will raise a prophet like unto you. Moses was a prophet. So if Exodus is in there, if we have there not just Malachi and uh, Isaiah, but also Exodus, is the majority reading in the prophets, is it still correct? Yes. Is the reading in Isaiah the prophet correct? No. There's no way around that. It is a factual error. Now, the usual evangelical approach to that is, is to do something like say, there was a scribal practice. There, there, there was an authorial practice that the Jews would have. Uh, they would link quotes together and ascribe it to just one person. Now, the interesting thing is, is uh, years ago, I, I started looking into this. And I looked at one apologist would try to answer. He said, yeah, they had this, this practice. Okay, I looked at where it was referenced. He referenced a different apologist. I looked up that apologist's book. He said the same thing. He referenced a third apologist. I went to the third apologist's book. He said the same thing. He referenced the fourth one. He went to the fourth one. The first, fourth one referenced the first one. These these rabbit trails. You would just go down. People kept making that claim. I kept looking for actual evidence. Any kind of like contemporary writing saying that, that Jews did this, I couldn't find anything. Looking time and time again, I finally found one thing from uh, James Patrick Holding where he cited a book by... Uh, Chages, a student's guide to the Talmud, where he said, here it says it. So I looked up that. I got that book. I went and got the book. I looked it up. It said nothing of the sort. Okay. And we think, it's not. why would people ascribe a quote from one person to another? Okay. Did that happen in Matthew 27, 9? If it happened, most people would say, well, it looks like there's two errors in the Bible here. Two wrongs don't make a right. Could you imagine like putting two plus two equals five on your math test, your little kid math test, and the teacher marks it wrong? And you say, well, even that other kid also wrote two plus two equals five. It must be a practice. It's not wrong. It's still wrong. In point of fact, if you look at that, that prophecy in Matthew 27, 9, it's not in Zechariah. Look at, look at what's in Zechariah. There are a few common points, but it's actually quite different. Okay. The thing there is, you, know, you may not like this explanation, but it says, as was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, not written by him. Okay, we don't know what kind of oral prophecies might have come down from Jeremiah to the first century, but we cannot say for a fact that was wrong because it doesn't say written. There's another prophecy in the same book, Matthew chapter 2, another prophecy whose fulfillment is recorded, but the original prophecy never is. And they went to Nazareth that it might be fulfilled what was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. You're not going to find that prophecy in the Old Testament, but it's okay. It doesn't say written, it said spoken. Okay? 2 Kings chapter 14, 25. You have recorded a fulfillment of a prophecy by Jonah, the son of Amittai, but you never have the prophecy actually recorded anywhere in the book of Jonah or anywhere in the Old Testament. So yeah, there was a, a practice of recording a fulfillment of an oral prophecy that was not written down. There was not a practice of ascribing to one man something that was said by another man. That would be an error. Uh, regarding Griesbach, I guess I really wasn't clear on this one because I didn't launch an ad hominem attack on Griesbach. I didn't say, oh, he's a bad guy. You can't trust what he says. But I say he's a rationalist. He held to a school of philosophy. And this is under the branch of epistemology. How do you get true knowledge? Rationalists said sensory data is not trustworthy. Empiricism is what we do now. You run experiments, you look. Rationalists said, no, you don't need to do that. You can't trust what your eyes tell you anyway. It all comes from just reasoning it out in your head. And that's how you reach the wrong conclusion. That's not an attack on him. That's, that's understanding what his philosophy was. Yeah. Bad guys can say wrong things, sure. Good guys can say wrong things. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, P66, was it sloppy because people are always on the run? Uh, persecution was not constant. In the, in the second century, it, it came in fits and starts. It wasn't like 
right, okay? It was a sloppy one, but I'm simply using that as a way to pick the most generous kind of number to do an actual calculation. Maybe he was sloppy because he was persecuted, but it's not the point. The point was it doesn't get sloppier than that. So if we pick the sloppiest example, we can use that to do our calculation. Is the majority always right? No. Majority is, I'm arguing for a view of textual criticism that most people disagree with, so obviously I'm not going to say the majority is always right. Uh, if they are, I may as well go home. Uh, but in this case, as I said, and I went through effort to show us, what you have is a large data mass and random variation. That is where statistical analysis does apply, and that is the cases where, and I showed it mathematically, the majority is right. Okay? Some, in some cases, no. In this case, yes. Now, what else do I want to get? Okay, I want to go back to something that Tony said before, and that was about the how the Alexandrian came to disappear. This is very significant. If the Alexandrian text was original, why did it disappear? Uh, and Tony said some things that, that were kind of interesting. Okay? One of the things that the reason eclectics will say is that the, the Byzantine text was produced in, in just a corner. Okay? It's, it's not really representative of the whole thing, it was produced in a corner. Uh, yeah. Yeah? Byzantine text was produced in a corner. Uh, people don't seem to understand what a corner it is. Here, here's Europe, okay? This is the year 600. So beginning of the 7th century. See the orange stuff? That's the Byzantine Empire. So when people say corner, that's not really a corner. It covers, oh, what happened to my, oh, here it is. <laughs> okay? Look at that. The entire east of the Mediterranean, the whole Balkans, Greece, much of Italy, North Africa, Egypt. This was not, it covered basically the entire Christian world. You had off at the side here a few barbarian kingdoms who didn't read Greek, didn't write Greek. So the Byzantine text was the text of the entire Christian world at the time. Now that Alexandria, see the little city there, Alexandria? That's a corner. Yeah. Byzantine Empire is not a corner. Now, Tony told us that the Byzantine text did not become the majority until the 9th century. Okay? He talked about persecutions before. He talked about they would be killed during the time of uh, Diocletian and the manuscripts were burned up. But the, ma the, the persecutions would have targeted all manuscripts equally. If you had 1,000 manuscripts and 900 were Byzantine and 100 Alexandrian and you got them burning, maybe you're down to 10 manuscripts at the end, you're still going to have a ratio of 9 to 1. The majority will stay the majority. The, the persecutions did not target a specific text type. And if the Byzantine didn't become the majority until the 9th century, if Alexandria was majority before that, guess what? Persecutions ended long before that. Christianity was legalized by Constantine at the, with the Edict of Milan in 313. By 380, Theodosius made Christianity the state religion. You were persecuted if you were not a Christian. Okay? So from 380 until the 9th century, you have what, 420 years? 420 years where Christians could write and copy and put, transmit and reproduce their Bibles. And the Byzantine was not the majority at this time. We're told the Alexandrian was. So why did it stop? This is Christians not living under persecution. This is Christians in a state religion, free to copy their manuscripts. If the Alexandrian was the better, if it was there all along, why did it stop being the majority? Why did Christians who were no longer persecuted, who didn't have to settle for what they had to settle for, who were able to go out and research and do and get the best text, why did they go with the Byzantine? Okay. There's, there's no explanation that has been uh, put forth that holds water to explain why, if the Alexandrian was, was the best and was the best from the beginning, was the majority for centuries, why it became supplanted. Uh, we're told uh, the first 300 years 
all church fathers quoted the Alexandrian. Uh, that's not, that's arguable, actually. Okay, problem with patristic quotation, that's the church fathers, okay? This is the, the claim that will be often made, is that all the church fathers in the first 300 years only quoted the Alexandrian. Uh, Sturz points out, there are no earlier Antiochian fathers. By Antiochian, it's what they, we call Byzantine, that, oh, sorry, my map is gone. <laughs> that part of the world that was supposed to be the, the hotbed of early Christianity, where the Byzantine text was supposedly developed. Okay? We have no earlier Antiochian fathers than Chrysostom, whose literary remains are extensive enough so the New Testament quotations may be analyzed as to the type of text they support. Uh, Fee, Gordon Fee agrees with that. We have no early fathers from Antioch or Asia Minor who cite the New Testament. So we don't know what kind of text they were using. At most, we know what the guys from Egypt were using. And again, if textual criticism is science, we need to have stratified data samples. We don't have that. We have, we have a top-heavy Egyptian, and that's it. Okay? The claim that the early church fathers did not quote the Byzantine text is, by the way, questionable. Bergen and Miller compiled 86,489 patristic quotations, excluding those that were obviously changed to match Byzantine. They found 60% side with the Byzantine. Uh, Miller compiled a testimony for 30 key passages and found 76% agreement with the Byzantine. Okay? Now, the mainstream textual critics will say, well, uh, Bergen and Miller were using inferior manuscripts. The question is, how do you know they're inferior? How do you decide they're inferior? Well, because they don't agree with the Oxford interview. More problems. When you look at the Church Fathers and you see a New Testament allusion in there, was it a verbatim quote? Were they trying to be word-for-word -word accurate or simply making an allusion? Fathers often quote the same text more than once and never in the same words twice. Clement's most accurate citation in the New Testament has five variants from the common text. The wildest manuscript has only three. The same is true with Polycarp and Justin. Tertullian can scarcely cite the same New Testament passage twice in exactly the same way. Okay? So the question has to be raised whether the fathers adjusted the wording of the passage to fit his argument or at least to fit the syntax of his sentence. The fathers widely studied and copied each other's writings so they cannot be assumed to be independent witnesses. Uh, and, this is very important from Suggs, the impression that the early fathers support the favorite Alexandrian text type against the majority text is mistaken. Actually, their texts are as much mixed as the early papyri. Alon's descriptive list of the church fathers' writings further demonstrates this to be the case. Mainline textual critics claim that the patristic witness to the Byzantine text type is invalid because it is simply the result of later assimilation, yet the mixed idiosyncratic nature of the patristic texts indicates that they were not in fact assimilated. Otherwise, why would they be so different? Suggs in New Testament Studies 4, it would be untrue to say that verbal accuracy was not an aim of the ancient scribe. There's little evidence of systematic revision of New Testament citations. A majority of modern textual call, uh, scholars consider patristic evidence, as long as it stands alone, to count for almost nothing in ascertaining the original text. Okay. And again, if they understood mathematics better, they'd understand that x plus zero is still just x. If, if it doesn't stand on its own, it doesn't get stronger by adding it to something else. The patristic quotations are a mishmash, like the papyri. They don't support one or another text type. But they do, on balance, if you look at the readings, side with the Byzantine more than anything else. Ooh, two minutes and 49 seconds. Don't want to let that go to waste. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, examples of where scribes intentionally changed. It's very difficult sometimes to know if a change was, in fact, intentional. I was reading through Metzger's uh, chapter on that. And he kept saying, well, see, they ex changed this for this. They changed this to agree with. Uh, they changed this to correct. They changed. It's still, he's not giving actual evidence that they did it on purpose. Okay? When it happened on purpose, very rare. That's why all the examples Tony cited, he could only eat very, very few manuscripts that had it, which underscores my point. Wrong readings, intentional changes would never infect the majority. It's mathematically impossible. Real science, folks. Uh.
Oh, God used the Latin Vulgate and the King James Version. Yes, he did. Okay? Don't get me wrong on this. God, most people do not read the New Testament the original Greek. Okay? Most people depend on translations. But the fact that inferior translations can be used by God doesn't mean that we should not try for the best. And if translations are not perfect, we're not talking about translations, we're talking about the original Greek text. So I think we need to get to the exact original inerrant Greek text and not think, well, okay, if, if it has errors in it, God could still use it. God can do anything he wants on this. But I don't believe that the Theopneustos word did have actual errors in it. And I think the majority reading approach that I showed is correct. It's scientifically based. And it does result in a text that is inerrant because God did not breathe out errors. Thank you. I I wasn't so good. I still have 37 seconds left. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Costa. Thank you, John. Uh, so what's going to happen now, it's going to, there's going to be a cross-examination from both speakers. Uh, they're each going to ask one another three questions. And then after that, um, we will open up the questions to the audience. Uh, what's going to happen is you're just going to be uh, lining up over here on this side. Uh, we have the microphone over there, and you just speak into the mic and ask questions, and you can address uh, either one of the speakers. Both of them will have time to respond to your questions, uh, just so that we maintain the fairness. Okay? So, uh, so Tony and John, I would like to invite you both to stand here. And Tony is going to ask the first question, and John's going to respond, and then Tony will respond back, and then John will ask the question. So they'll go back and forth. Each will get three questions. Thank you very much. So I have a minute, is that to ask yeah, the question? Yeah. Oh, you put my okay. computer here. All right. So three questions each? Okay. Okay, so uh, John, I'm, uh, if I can direct your attention to the screen, I brought this up earlier. Uh, you had mentioned earlier that Matthew 27, verse 9, that this was not an actual quote, but that it was a, um, an oral saying of the prophet Jeremiah. Um, and then I pointed to Matthew 1, 22 to 23, where if you notice in the Greek text there uh, of, John, of Matthew 1, 20, 22, uh, Matthew does not say that this was written by the prophet. He's quoting from Isaiah 7, 14. He does not say that this was written by the prophet. You'll notice that uh, he uses the, um, the participle legontos there, the same word that is used by Matthew 27, verse 9, where he says that uh, the word that was fulfilled by Jeremiah, legontas, same. Same structure, same word. Um, so my question to you then is, why do you take Matthew 27, 9 not to be an actual quote by Jeremiah when it has the very same grammatical structure as Matthew 1, 22 to 23, where Matthew's quoting Isaiah, uh, the prophecy of the virgin birth? Okay, good question. Uh, the reason is this. Matthew tends to use spoken more often than it says written. It refers to a prophecy. A prophecy can be spoken as well as written. But when I look at Matthew 27, 9, it's not in Jeremiah. It's not in Zechariah. That passage in Zechariah 11 really has a few points of contact, but it is not the prophecy there. So then I ask myself, if it's not in Jeremiah... And if it's not in Zechariah, he didn't put the wrong name on, on the prophet accident saying Jeremiah instead of Zechariah, since it's not really in Zechariah. What could be happening here? Matthew can use Lego spoken with written prophecies, but he also can use them with ones that are not written. He does that in Matthew chapter 2 in regards to, as was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Before I come to Matthew 27, I come to Matthew 2, and I see here's a prophecy that Matthew says was spoken by prophets, but it's not recorded anywhere in the Old Testament. Therefore, can Matthew refer to oral prophecies 
Yes. Matthew 27, 9. Does it look like he's referring to an oral prophecy? It does because it's not written anywhere in the Old Testament. Is it a mistake to say it? Was it a mistake in Matthew chapter 2 when he said, wait, I can't see the time. How much time do I have left? Oh, okay. I, I didn't want to go too long. That's what I was asking. Sorry. See, I'm, I'm new at this. Uh, the bottom line is not a mistake. If it says spoken, then unless you can prove it was never spoken by Jeremiah, it cannot be considered a mistake. But if it says written and it's not written, then it can. And that's why Mark 1 2 is different from Matthew 27 9. Why, uh, do I ask another question? Yeah. Okay, I can, I can address that to, uh, to what he just said. To what he just said. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, uh, well, let me just address that. Um, I think John still has not dealt with the problem. If you look at Matthew 27, 9, it, it says that this was fulfilled, what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. And then you have a quotation. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him on whom the price had been set by some of the sons of Israel. And that is an exact quote from the prophet Zechariah in chapter 11. Um, and so this is what explains the, the addition in other manuscripts where other scribes came along and added the word Zechariah because they saw the problem. And others deleted the problem by removing the name Jeremiah so that it said that it may be fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet, just like Mark 1, 2 in the majority text. So the, the grammatical structure in Matthew 1, to 23, for those of you who know Greek, you will notice it's exactly the same as the grammatical structure in Matthew 27, verse 9. And you'll notice that he attributes it to the prophet Jeremiah. Now, does that mean that there's a mistake? Well, no, because the Jewish tendency or the Jewish habit of clustering scriptural passages together was common. And Matthew 2.23, where it says, as it was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called the Nazarene. This is a summation where Matthew is summing up what the prophets said about the Messiah. And we know where the prophets spoke about the Messiah being a Nazarene, Isaiah 11. There, the Messiah is said to be a netzer. A netzer shall come. And a netzer is, is that shoot, the shoot that will come out of Jesse. Um, and so when you read Zechariah, who speaks of the Messiah as the branch, Isaiah speaks of him as the shoot that comes out of, out of Jesse and so forth, and you look at the suffering servant of the Lord, all of these combined together show that the Messiah would be a Nazarene. Uh, but in that passage, Matthew 2.23, Matthew is giving us a summation, just like in Luke 14, I believe it is, Jesus said, the Son of Man is going to Jerusalem, as it is written in the prophets about him, where he, he sums what all the prophets had said about the mission of the Messiah. But I think Matthew 27, verse 9, can't just be dismissed as, oh, this is just an unknown oral prediction by uh, Jeremiah. It's an exact quote from Zechariah uh, in the Septuagint. Uh, okay, which one should I ask? Okay, uh, most textual critics, when you start dealing with textual criticism, whether they're Christian or not, say that you have to leave the concept of inerrancy on the shelf. It is a, uh, it is a theological thing. Uh, it's not for this kind of scholarship. Uh, while Dr. Wallace actually says that when textual critics who believe in inerrancy put Isaiah the prophet into Mark 1, 2, they are showing what he called the deepest integrity because they're putting in what looks like an error to them. What is your understanding of how should a Christian who believes in inerrancy, what should, how should that affect how he does textual criticism? I think that uh, when we look at inerrancy, the first thing we have to do is establish the fact that we understand that inerrancy only applies to the original uh, autographs, the original text. And the texts that we have before us are copies and of copies of copies of copies. And what that also involves is that when we read scripture, I think it's very important that we read scripture within the context in which it was given. And that is we cannot allow, uh, scripture was not given in a vacuum. We have to read it in its proper context. And just the other day on, uh, on Easter Sunday, <clears throat> just this is germane to what you've asked, John, uh, a young lady came to me and said, um, Jesus must have been in the tomb for three days and three nights, 72 hours, because it says as Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days, three nights, son of man has to be in the, in the heart of the earth three days, three nights. But Jesus was not there for three days, three nights, if you count Good Friday. 
as of the day of his death and so forth. Well, and I, I mentioned to her that that's because the problem is Western readers are reading that through Gentile eyes. You have to read it as a Jew. To a Jew, a part of a day is equivalent to the whole day. A part of a month is equivalent to the whole month. A part of a year is equivalent to the whole year. And so when we apply this understanding, this cultural understanding of chronology to the inspired text, then we see that there is no contradiction in a Good Friday uh, crucifixion and Easter Sunday resurrection. So, so what I'm saying here is this. What may look to us as something strange and bizarre in the text, and may, like Isaiah speaking uh, about this messenger and so forth, I think we have to allow the text to, to, to speak for itself, take into uh, account the culture in, it w in which it was given, the customs uh, in which these biblical writers uh, would have written in and, and their worldview and so forth. So I think it's possible for us to hold to inerrancy at the same time, but also to understand that the scriptures were not written in the 21st century. They're written in a certain time, a certain locale, a certain culture, a certain language. I don't know if that answers your question, John. Uh, oh, I, I get yeah. to redirect, I think it's called. Okay. Uh, I, I know you said it applies to the original, but that's the point is we're trying to get back to the original. So when you have a choice between variants where one would make an error and the other wouldn't, uh, that was my question. Like how, how would that affect? But uh, in terms of what you said about culture, what worries me here is what's called epistemological relativism. There, there's a correspondence uh, theory of truth where truth corresponds to what really is. And then the epistemolo epistemological relativism is that the truth applies to the culture and it can change from one place to another. So that you could say Isaiah wrote something when he didn't, but it's okay if that was the cultural practice. But to me, when scripture is breathed by God, who is above all human culture, who's writing for everybody. You see in uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, where it's, uh, even the prophets were looking at what they were writing, trying to understand it, and it was revealed to them they weren't writing for themselves or their generation, but for us to, upon whom the ends of the age have come. God can write better than that. I don't see him being bound by cultural practice, and I'd be worried about something that is factually wrong being justified on the basis of, well, that's the way the culture did it. Another question. Okay, well, tied into that, John, you've raised a very good uh, point. Um, in Leviticus 11, you have the dietary laws where God gave Israel the, the rules of what animals were clean and what animals were unclean. And um, in, in Leviticus 11, I believe it's verse 6 or 7, it says that one of the animals that was unclean to the Jews was the hare or the rabbit. And the reason why the Lord said that the hare or the rabbit was unclean to the Jews was because even though it chews the cud, it does not have a split hoof, like a cow, a goat, etc. But we know that scientifically speaking, uh, a rabbit does not chew the cud. Uh, a rabbit does not have a multi-chambered stomach like a cow, a goat, a uh, sheep, and so forth. So um, would that not be a scientific error on the part of God to tell us that, that rabbits chew the cud? No. Why is that? Okay. <laughs> that was the second question. <laughs> Okay, the reason you have to understand, whenever you're translating from one language to another, words very rarely have exactly identical semantic ranges. Another supposed error that comes up in Leviticus is that a bat is listed as an unclean bird. And we'll say, well, bats aren't bird, bats are mammals. But that's how we define the English word bird, is an animal with hollow bones, feathers, warm blood, and so on. The Hebrew word of doesn't mean that. Of was a winged creature other than insects. The closest word we can use to translate that is, uh, in English, is bird. So we use that in English. But it's on air because Hebrew didn't call it a bird. It called it an of, which is a winged animal, which is actually correct. The problem there is the, the incomplete correspondence of the semantic range. In the case of chewing the cud, Hares do what's called refection. Basically, this sounds disgusting, but they eat their own droppings. Yeah, their, their digestive system isn't all that good. A lot of nutrients is still left in the droppings, and so they pick up in their mouth and chew it and get more nutrition out of it, which is what a cow does when it's chewing the cud in a different fashion. So chewing the cud is the closest way we can call that in English, but the Hebrew isn't looking at the number of 
uh, stomachs, chambers, and so on, simply looking at the fact that an animal will eat again what it ate once before. So it's not an error if you look at what the actual Hebrew means. Okay. I would say that a dog would chew the cut because dogs eat their own feces and other dogs' feces, but no one would say that dogs uh, are ruminants. Um, and obviously, uh, this is uh, a hair is not a, is not a ruminant. It doesn't chew the cud. And so, uh, the reason why I raise this up is because a lot of skeptics raise this as an objection against the Bible that the Bible is scientifically wrong. Here's another example: the word for whale and fish is the Hebrew word dog, and the word dog uh, was used by the Hebrews to refer to any creature that lived in the oceans or in the waters. But a fish is not a, a whale is not a fish. So what am I saying? I'm saying exactly what I said earlier, and that is we have to understand that to the Hebrews, anything that lived in the waters was a fish. A whale was considered a large fish, but that is scientifically incorrect. So what am I saying? We are adjusting our understanding by looking at the culture, by understanding that um, not everything that the Bible says about things, uh, in the case of these unclean and clean animals, is scientifically accurate. Well, why, does the, why is the rabbit or the hare said to chew the cud? Well, very simple. When you look at a rabbit, and they're the cutest little things, aren't they? When you look at a rabbit and it's eating, what does it do with its mouth? You see, animals that chew the cud, they, their, their jaws move this way, sideways. And when you see those little bunnies, when they start eating, what do they do? Their mouths move back and forth like this. And so to the Hebrew, to the Jew, it looks like, what is it doing? It looks like it's chewing the cud. So, so, so here's an example of where we have to understand that these words, and John openly admitted with the bat, the bat's called an oaf. An oaf is a, is a flying creature in the Hebrew text. Um, but a bat is not a bird. A bat is a, is a mammal with wings. But I can understand why the Hebrews would call it a flying thing. But, tax, but in terms of taxonomy, that is not a scientifically accurate statement. But that's exactly my point. We, we have to put ourselves, launch ourselves into the context, into the, into the, the, the time period, the milieu, of the biblical writers in order for us to understand what they're saying. And I apologize if I went over time. Okay, one of the things that concern me about uh, mainstream textual criticism is that textual critics generally have decided and agreed that you can never fully recover the original text. You can come close, but you can't come right to it. Now, I remember you said that you think we can. Uh, going from the second edition of, of United Bible Society's Greek text to the third, the editors made over 300 changes with no significant new evidence coming in. This latest edition of Nestle Aland, which came out in uh, 2014, 28th edition, it's gone through 28 editions, and what it says here, see, he doesn't have the cool wrapper, I do. I do, look. <laughs> you don't have the wrapper. <laughs> This is the scholarly edition of the Greek New Testament. This is the more scholarly edition. <laughs> it says, now thoroughly revised. Completely revised. They couldn't get it right in 27 editions. It keeps changing. It's like trying to nail jello to a tree. You can never quite get it. There's going to be another 28 edition. Our children are going to be debating. Look, it's the 56th edition of Nestle Allon, and it's now thoroughly revised. Is that not a problem that, even if you don't agree, that this approach to textual criticism pretty much says you're never going to be able to get back to the original? I think that uh, just like no translation is, is the final arbiter, I think that every translation can be approved upon. I think, I think one of the, chain, uh, one of the uh, 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 edition, that edition, the 28th, I think in Jude 5 or 6, it actually restored the name Jesus there where it talks about Jesus taking the people out of Egypt for himself, which is a very strong testimony to the, the deity of Christ. Um, yeah, I have, I have the Nestle Allen 28 as well. I think what it shows us, John, is that, is that we are still trying to get back to the original. Like you said earlier, the whole point of textual criticism is try to get back to the original. Now, we also have here uh, the Greek New Testament according to the majority text by Hodges and Farstad. And there's another one that John, I think, uh, showed us by, by Robinson, uh, Maurice Robinson and Pier, Pierpont. Is that the one you have, yeah. right? So if you were to look at the, the, um, the Greek New Testament according to the majority text, this is not a uniform text. Even Robinson said this is not a uniform text. If you look at it, you'll see there's a critical apparatus at the bottom. 
and, and, it, and it gives you these different readings that appear within the majority text as well. Um, and, and, so, and so what this demonstrates to us is that we don't have a uniform text. We're still trying to, we're, we are doing our best to represent the original as best as we can. Uh, and, and so this, I think, is, this is, the, the, this is the field. I think that the field of New Testament criticism is, is to do the best that we can. Someone during the, the break was, was telling me about a, a passage in the Old Testament where, where the Lord says, I create evil, and, and so forth. And, and they were wondering, well, why, why would the King James translators translate it that way, that God creates evil since he's not the author of evil? And, and I was trying to point out that it's not usually... It's not the, the, the original text that's the problem here. A lot of the times, it's, it's translation. And the word for evil there, ra'a in Hebrew, can mean evil, but it could also mean destruction and calamity. The Lord ordains calamity for certain judgments and so forth. So I think, John, that what, what this shows us is that, is that we are doing the best we can to, to get back to the original. And, and I think that um, the 28th edition of Nisalaam is attempting to do that. Redirect? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> first, I, if I recall correctly, the critical apparatus in Hodges Farstad is simply to show where there are variations with the critical text, what lines up with what. They're not actually challenging the majority text per yeah. se. The problem I'll with Hodges. I'll let you look at it, John, but yeah. it, it does. The yeah, problem, you look at it. the problem with Hodges Farst as yeah. they try to use schematics in the Pericope Adultera and in mm -hmm. the Book of Revelation instead mm -hmm. of using the majority approach. Mm -hmm. um, but still, the point is, a translation is not the same thing as the original Greek text. There are many different ways to translate, you know, that any given Greek word, you can probably find two, three, four, five different English words, and you have to decide which one to pick again because semantic ranges aren't exactly the same. So the fact that you can try to get better and better translations doesn't, it's not the same as whether you can get back to the original Greek text or not. And so when you said that, this is their latest iteration, that's my point. This, this has been around for more than 100 years now, and 28 editions, and they still haven't gotten there, uh, which makes me think they're not ever going to get there. The majority reading approach, and I gave my reasons why I think it's the best, gets you right there. My last question, okay. So uh, earlier, uh, John, during, during the discussion, um, we're, we're, we're talking about the New Testament, reconstructing the New Testament. Um, when the New Testament quotes from the Old Testament, it quotes predominantly from the Septuagint translation, from the Greek translation of the Old Testament. But from what we know about the Hebrew Masoretic text, the Hebrew Masoretic text, uh, the, the Aleppo Codex and the Leningrad Codex, respectively, uh, would be considered the majority text in terms of the Hebrew. But the New Testament, um, in many places, uh, even the King James does this, uh, and the New King James, in many places, the New Testament, um, at least 85 to 90% of the time, quotes from the Greek translation of, of the Old Testament. Um, would you agree that the majority text approach that, we, that you apply to the New Testament would have serious problems when, if you were to apply the same principle to the Old Testament? Oh. <clears throat> uh, first, I wouldn't even agree that they quote the Septuagint. I think the Dead Sea Scrolls have shown that the Hebrew text in Jesus' day was in many places aligning with the Septuagint rather than with the much later Masoretic text. In terms of your question, uh, I would think that the majority approach would certainly be difficult with the Hebrew, but here's the thing about statistical analysis. You need a statistically significant sample in order to, for that to work with random variation. We have 5,800 Greek manuscripts, top-heavy towards the later centuries, but going back to the second century uh, and coming forward into the 15th or even the 16th century, that is a stratified statistically significant sample, and that is why statistical analysis works. The Hebrew database just doesn't have that. That's why we have to use a different method. Okay. Well, then this raises a lot of questions in terms of the uh, inspiration of the Old Testament, in terms of the manuscript evidence, which you admitted is different from the new. Um, <clears throat> but I was surprised by your statement that the Septuagint, uh, you don't believe that it quotes from the Septuagint, 
which, which, is, which is alarming because um, we do have copies of the Septuagint from Vaticanus. I believe Sinaiticus as well has it. Um, but in terms of the, for example, in Psalm 22, 16, we have the famous passage of they, they pierced my hands and my feet, which interestingly enough, the King James uh, quotes, and that's not, of course, the, that's not the uh, meaning of the Hebrew text. If you read the Hebrew text of Psalm 22, 16, it says, like a lion, they were at my hands and my feet. And so the reading, they pierced my hands and my feet, actually come from the Septuagint and the Dead Sea Scrolls. And Deuteronomy 32, 8, of course, it talks about God numbered the nations according to the sons of Israel. That's the Masoretic text. But in the Septuagint, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it says according to the sons of God uh, and so forth. Um, so m my concern with John's approach is that since Christians believe that the 66 books of Scripture are the inspired word of God, if we were to apply the same standard that John applies to the New Testament, to the Old Testament, we're going to have some serious problems. In fact, we're going to be delving very closely to Marcionism where Marcion simply threw out the Old Testament and said, we don't need the Old Testament. We have the New Testament. The God of the New Testament is not the God of the Old Testament, and so forth and so on. And so in terms of consistency, if, we are, if we're going to make it a numbers game, or as Maurice Robinson calls it, uh, counting noses, if we apply that standard to the Old Testament, we're going to be in serious trouble. Uh, and, and that would eventually undermine the, the, the trustworthiness of the Old Testament. So um, I think we have to be consistent in our approach to the scriptures, whether it's the New Testament or the Old Testament. And, and that matters uh, a lot when we deal with apologetics and reaching out to folks who are skeptical about the Bible. Do I have a last question? Okay. Um, which one should I ask? Okay, that's a good one. <clears throat> I know you've debated the Muslim apologist Shabir Ali in the past, I think more than once. Yeah, about 12 times. Okay, that, that is more than once. And yes. counting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He is a very able speaker. He's very good at what he does. I think he's probably the best uh, Muslim Dawahist by yeah, far. Uh, and I've listened to a lot of his debates. An awful lot of his attacks on the New Testament are based on readings that come out of the critical text, attacks that actually would disappear and be completely vitiated with the majority reading approach. So uh, how much weaker do you think his case would be against the gospel if you were arguing against a, a majority text, New Testament, instead of against the, the Nestle Alon? Well, uh, myself and, and many others that debate Shabir, like James White and others, uh, we have uh, taken the time uh, in, in writing and in private to, to talk to Shabir Ali about the way he's approached uh, his... It doesn't matter if it's the majority text or the critical text, John. Uh, Shabir's got a divide and conquer approach, uh, which means he will, he will uh, find any, any chink he finds in the armor, he's going, to, he's going to take it down. So what I've done with Shabir is, because um, I've studied Islam and studied the Quran extensively, um, there are also textual problems with the Quran. There's also textual variation in the Quran. Uh, we have uh, recensions of the Quran. Uh, we have the Warsh edition the Hoff's edition, and so forth. So what I do is I use that opportunity to actually turn the tables on him and say, okay, Shabir, uh, there's, there's textual problems with the New Testament transmission, but there's also textual problems with, with the Quran. And guess what? They're, they're exactly the same. They're exactly the same as what we find with the critical text, not the majority text. Because Muslims don't go with the majority text or the critical text. Muslims go by a homogenous text. The Quran has never been changed. It's the same text that we had since the days of Muhammad. So actually, it actually uh, affords me the opportunity to actually engage with my Muslim friends. And just this past Sunday, I just, I just baptized a former Muslim who came to faith in Christ. Um, and it's because of the investment of time that we give to these people answering their questions, like questions that John has raised up, the very questions that John has raised up about these so-called uh, uh, problems with the critical text. Muslims have brought them up to me, and we've engaged them, we've answered their questions, and you know what, they, what we have found is that when you take the time to answer these questions in a respectful way, in, in, in a God-fearing way, in a God-honoring way, there are results. And so there are answers to these questions. And Shabir, the reason why Shabir likes bringing uh, these, these issues up is because he's trying to discredit Christianity. But he does the same thing with the Old Testament. He will tell you that uh, if you read 1 Samuel 13, verse 1, in the Masoretic text, it says that Saul was one year old when he ruled Israel. He was a child. Imagine that, a toddler at one years old, ruling Israel on the throne. 
Um, and that's obviously a textual variant in the Masoretic text that is corrected in the Septuagint. Um, so, so what I find done in my experience with Shabir, and I've known the man for 12 years. I mean, I've, I've known him since Jesus was around. Uh, and, He's still and so, around. Yeah, and, so, and, and I still know him. Uh, but you know what? Um, I, I see a man who has changed, a man who is, is beginning to listen, uh, and it's my prayer that God uh, saves him and brings him, brings him to salvation. Oh, yeah, I, I certainly share. I hope that he does, and I'm yeah. glad. But it really, the question wasn't really answered, though. Uh, Shabir, among other things, he has his presentation of eight ways in which Matthew elevates the picture of Mark. One of those is dependent on uh, claiming that scribes changed Matthew 19.6 to make it look like... I turned it off. What happened? It's a sign. It's a is, sign. Is it Shabir? Shabir Ali calling? I'm afraid not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the absence of the last uh, 12 verses on Mark, the so-called geographical errors in Mark, all of which are based on minority readings that really should not be in the original, I think would be an awful lot easier to make the case for the Bible without having to try to explain away errors that I don't think belong there but have come in through minority corruptions. So John would, would be. Okay, <clears throat> five minutes. Can I see the time? Okay, uh, Karen Vetterhan was a chemistry professor at Dartmouth College 20 years ago. She was in the lab one day doing research into the toxic properties of the metal cadmium when she happened to drip one or two drops of dimethyl mercury onto her hand. Uh, she didn't think much of it at the time because she was wearing latex safety gloves as the safety guidelines dictated. Uh, she thought she was safe. She did not realize that she was already doomed. She went about her business for the next few months completely oblivious to the fact that the safety guidelines were wrong. Dimethyl mercury seeped through her latex glove in about 15 seconds and entered her body. From outside, everything looked fine. And she had no way of knowing that there was a tiny drop or two of poison in her that was spreading inside, eating away, and destroying her. Minor symptoms finally began to appear after three months, and when major symptoms appeared two months later, she discovered what had happened, but nothing could be done to save her. She continued to deteriorate, and ten months after she had dripped those one or two little drops on her hand, Karen Vetterhan passed away. I believe the church is in a very similar situation now. We have ingested a poison that is slowly destroying us. The symptoms have already appeared and are well known. The decline in church attendance, the decline in serious discipleship, uh, the lack of any effect on society as a whole, widespread biblical ignorance among Christians, and the large-scale abandonment of the church by our youth are just some of the symptoms. What is this poison we have ingested? I believe it is the erosion of trust in the Bible and its authority. It has been brought in not by one or two drops on a latex glove, but by means of what I've elsewhere called the three-headed monster of historical criticism and textual criticism packaged with liberal paradigm assumptions and Darwinism, all being used to undermine the Bible by showing it is wrong in what it asserts. The most subtle of these is textual criticism because it seems like such a neutral scholarly field. Christians embrace it in all good faith. They believe the Bible is the word of God. They believe in inerrancy. But they don't realize that there are biases involved in it. Many sincere Christians accept the claims of mainstream textual criticism and then struggle to try to explain why the errors that are now in the Bible aren't really errors. And ways around that can be made up with varying degrees of plausibility, but for too many of the people, they can't fool themselves. They see the errors as errors. People like Bart Arman, 
their trust in the Bible is eroded, that is passed on to those they teach and pastor, and many have become very comfortable with that. And so the poison continues to spread inside us with all its dire effects. Does it affect everybody? No. Does it affect some people? Yes. It doesn't have to be that way. Textual criticism done properly by the majority reading approach is not a foe of the Bible. But textual criticism that is based on false assumptions, that ignores the nature of the evidence of the papyri, that doesn't understand the strength of statistical analysis is another story. What have we seen tonight? We have seen that that carefully constructed structure of mainstream textual criticism, centuries old now, was built on sand, on the assumption that scribes freely took it upon themselves to change the scripture to correct errors in them. And how's that for bias? There were errors to start. That assumption is the linchpin for reasoned eclecticism, and if it is wrong, the whole enterprise is wrong. I know I'm fighting an uphill battle here. Okay? I don't expect many scholars to listen to what I'm saying. I know that many, many lay people will continue to go with what is in the books and the seminaries. They will not go against scholarly orthodoxy. But I think this has to change for the health of the church, for the sake of our children. It has to be you people doing it. You have to stop buying the Bibles with errors in them. That's the only thing that's going to do it. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to express my deep gratitude to all of you for being here uh, tonight on a Saturday evening when you could have been watching the Leafs and the Capitals. Um, but you're here. You know why? Because this matters. And because as Christians, we have to know this. Um, John made some very good points there about how we are facing a crisis in our society. And, and I deal with this all the time in the seminary, and I deal with this in dealing with uh, skeptics and atheists uh, who I engage with and so forth. But ultimately, folks, the problem is not whether or not we're using the critical text or the Byzantine text. The problem is what Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is desperately wicked above all things. Men are dead. Men are spiritually dead. Men are enemies of God. Men are God-haters. Not because of the critical method or the Byzantine method or the, pri or, or the majority or, or the minority or whatever it may be. The basic problem is man's spir uh, spiritual estate. He is a rebel against God and he needs to lay down his, his arms and surrender to the creator. The other, the other issue as well is uh, he mentioned Bart Ehrman. And guess what text led Bart Ehrman to uh, become uh, a renegade, an apostate? Mark chapter 2, verse 25 to 26. Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those were with him. How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he also gave it to those who were with him. That was the linchpin that led Bart Ehrman into apostasy. And that's what the King James also has. It says in the days of Abiathar the high priest, and here's the problem. The problem that the skeptics throw at the King James and the new King James is that Abiathar was not the high priest in the time that David went with his men and ate the showbread. It was Ahimelech. Now, we can explain that. There are answers to that objection and so forth. But that is what did it for Bart Ehrman. And guess where it was found? It was found in the King James Bible. Do we blame the King James Bible for his apostasy? Of course not. Absolutely not. God, as I said before, has been pleased to use his word, whether it was in the Latin Vulgate, whether it was in the Textus Receptus, even in the Byzantine uh, uh, text tradition. God has been pleased to use the Alexandrian uh, manuscripts. God has never been without a witness in human history. God has spoken. God has revealed himself through his word. And yes, textual criticism is a tough go. God does not make things easy for us. He did not make things easy for the parents of Jesus. For a young woman to be pregnant without being yet married was a very difficult thing. God does not make things easy for us. And so the, the issue before us here tonight, again, is we are trying to get to the original. We want to get back to that original text. But folks, 
I've been following the Lord now for about over almost 40 years. And I have been following in, in this tradition and through my, through my studies and so forth. It has not made me a weaker Christian. It has made me a more stronger Christian. It has given me more confidence in the scriptures, so much so that I can take on Muslims in university settings. I can debate atheists and chairs of philosophy because I know that the word of God that we have is secure. That the word of God, the word of the Lord endures forever. Yes, do we have textual variants, but here's another thing that John did not mention. None of these textual variants affect any cardinal teaching of the Christian faith. There is nothing in those textual variants that affect the Trinity, the deity of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, salvation by grace alone, nothing either in the Byzantine manuscripts or in the Alexandrian manuscripts. Now, if John wants to judge the New Testament on a majority, which I find problematic, basing it on statistics, is truth determined by majority? Is truth determined by counting noses? No, because many times it's the minority that has it right. God worked through a remnant in the days of Elijah. They had the word of God in the days of Elijah. What did they do? They apostatized. They worshiped Baal. And there was only one prophet who thought he was alone, but there were 7,000 in reserve. The word of God was among his people in those days. But you see, that's the problem. The problem isn't the word. The problem is the heart. The heart of man is desperately evil and incurably sick, as Jeremiah says. That's why we need to proclaim the risen Christ to this dying world. Satan wants to divide us amongst ourselves because he wants to keep our eyes off the mission field. Our eyes are to be fixed on that mission field. Where's the mission field? Outside these four walls. Let's go out there and change the world for Jesus Christ. As long as Satan has us divided, we will always remain a divided house, and a divided house cannot stand. Thank you. Thank you, speakers. Uh, I now welcome any questions from the floor. Uh, if you have any questions, please, uh, you may step forward and ask your question. So my question is, what do you believe is the authentic conclusion to the Gospel of Mark? And could you please uh, share the evidence with us? Uh, you can ask both. Both then. Both then. Yeah. It's up to you. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm of the conviction that Mark 16 ends at verse 8. Um, and the reason for that is because the early manuscripts that we have of the Gospel of Mark uh, end at verse 8. And when we look at the longer ending, Irenaeus knew about it. He was aware of that longer ending. But he was also aware of Acts 8.37, where the Ethiopian eunuch uh, uh, said to Philip, I want to be baptized. And Philip said, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you may be baptized. Irenaeus knew of that reading, but yet that reading doesn't appear anywhere in the majority text. It appears in the Textus Receptus, because it was in the volume, but it doesn't appear in the majority text. So if Arianus knew of that reading, why is it not in our present Bibles? Um, now, Jerome knew about the longer ending, but he said it's absent in many of the Greek manuscripts that, that he knows of. And so Eusebius said the same thing. So when there's doubt about a certain passage of scripture, or assumed scripture, and you've got people like Jerome, who was responsible for translating the Bible into the Latin Vulgate, raising these, these questions about its authenticity, then that gives me pause. You see, folks, I, I want to know what Mark wrote. I don't want to know what some scribe thought he wrote or was supposed to write. I want to know what the inspired writer Mark said. And if you look at the longer ending of, of Mark, you will notice that it contains uh, elements that are found in Matthew 28, in Luke 24, John 21, and Acts 1, and Acts 2, the speaking in tongues. And so if Mark ends at verse 8, then it would seem very odd that he would not have an account of the apparitions, the post-mortem appearances, like Matthew, Luke, and John, uh, John did. And so this would, of course, cause uh, someone to say, hey, you know, wait a minute, uh, Matthew, Luke, John have Easter post-mortem narratives. Why doesn't Mark have one? And so a number of answers have been given. Uh, the longer ending got lost, or 
um, Mark was martyred or attacked uh, before he finished his gospel, or the other view is that Mark actually ended the gospel at verse 8. And I think that that is what Mark actually intended to do. If you look at the gospel of Mark, he, he, he is filled with irony. The idea of Mark is that no one understands who Jesus is. The, the Roman centurion knows who he is, the, the demon-possessed person knows who he is, the Roman soldiers know who he is, but the disciples keep failing to understand who Jesus is. And, and it's filled with irony. You have that story in Mark, that weird story where he heals a blind man. And he heals him. And then he says, can you see? And he says, I, I see men as walking trees. They look like trees walking around. And then Jesus spits in his eyes and heals him. What's Mark saying? Well, Mark is saying that, that the issue here is that the disciples, they see, but they don't see clearly. And in the, in the verse 8, what you have is, you have this ironic ending to the gospel. The end of the gospel ends with this irony. The women run away from the tomb and they're afraid. They don't say anything. And so I think Mark deliberately ends it that way to say to the reader, who is this Jesus? What are you going to do with this risen one? What are you going to do with this Jesus? And so I, I think that Mark deliberately ends the gospel in a, in a, in a note of irony. Oh, I would say that the, <clears throat> the last 12 verses are certainly authentic. Uh, when we say earliest manuscripts, uh, it's present about 1,700 manuscripts of Mark. It's missing at only two. And those two are, guess what, Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. The testimony of both of them are questionable because if you look through the New Testament of Codex uh, Vaticanus, you'll find that every time the scribe finishes writing a uh, book, he starts at the top of the very next column. Only one place in the entire manuscript is that different. There's an entire blank column left after Mark 16, 8, as if the scribe knew that I have more to put in, but for some reason he didn't have access to it. In Sinaiticus, the original pages containing the end of Mark have, were removed and replaced long after by a scribe who stretched out his writing to try to avoid leaving an entire blank column, just managed to get on top of the next column and then put some nice squiggles there. So the testimony, the only two manuscripts that are missing this are very questionable. Secondly, yes, Irenaeus did mention it in the first century. And to say, well, maybe Irenaeus, well, Irenaeus was wrong on, on Acts 8, that means he's wrong on this, not likely. Uh, the fellow who wrote the, uh, the Attestation, he put it in as well in AD 70, 10 years before Irenaeus mentioned it. Early church fathers, long before Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, we're quoting from this passage. So the idea of somehow that fourth century questionable evidence can override second century evidence doesn't fly. The idea that Mark would end the gospel at 16 8 doesn't make sense either. How would you end a gospel where you have Jesus telling, foretelling that he will rise from the dead and he never does it? What do we do with Jesus in that case? He didn't rise. We do nothing with him. If he didn't rise, he's a fake. Right? So it doesn't seem even remotely possible that those 12 verses are not authentic. But here's an example of how textual criticism does undermine the Bible and even the resurrection, because liberal scholars now love to do it. They say, well, Mark, Mark was the first. Mark in priority. There was no Mark in priority until Sinaiticus and Vaticanus were discovered. Then suddenly Mark is the first gospel. Matthew and Luke copied from Mark and from Q. No resurrection in Q, no resurrection in Mark. Look at that, the first two earliest documents of Jesus don't have resurrection. And they use that to undercut it. And I'll tell you one thing about the, uh, the <laughs> this is good. The fellow, the blind man healed of Bethesda, Mark eight twenty two to 25. You know what? Some people don't like science in the Bible. It is a perfect description of a phenomenon called post-blind syndrome that was not known until the 20th century. This is why, you, why commentators couldn't figure out what's going on here. Jesus seemed to get it wrong the first time. He didn't quite get it right. Because he touched the man, and then the man, I see men like trees walking. He's not seeing right. And Jesus has to touch him again. Why? We never figured that out until the 20th century. When we finally were able to heal certain conditions of blindness, our technology improved, and then doctors found something that nobody had foreseen. They used to think that if a guy's blind, his eyes don't work, fix the eyes, everything's fine. That wasn't the case. When you're blind, five years or more, born blind, two problems. Your eyes don't work, and the visual cortex of your brain is atrophied. It can no longer decode the information coming in from your eyes. You fix the eyes, in goes the data, your brain scrambles it. 
You mix images together. You see men in front of a grove of trees, and it looks like trees walking. And so Jesus touched him. He healed the same. Normally, he did both in one step. This time, he did the two separately. As proof for us today, we can absolutely prove that that was a genuine miracle. Once you can prove one, the other ones don't have to be questioned anymore. I think the gentleman. <laughs> really? many. Um, this is for Dr. Costa. Um, John did mention, I think, in your response, you were talking about um, how they take Mark, the last, eight, last nine verses of Mark, and pretty much get rid of their resurrection. And you said that uh, the new te- the, in the entire Bible, the textual variants don't undermine any, any significant part of the faith. But the resurrection is pretty much what we stand on. If Christ didn't rise, then we don't, we, we, Christianity doesn't exist. So then how do you respond to the fact that if you take Mark in priority and then you get rid of the last eight verses of, uh, nine verses of Mark and then have them copy each other, right. Shabir completely destroys the, I've, I've heard that lecture and he destroys yeah. the case of Jesus Christ rising and being deity. So how do you respond to that? Excellent question. In fact, I was hoping someone would ask that question. So you're an answer to prayer. Um, there is a resurrection in Mark 16. In fact, there's three passion predictions in Mark where Jesus says, the Son of Man is going to Jerusalem and he's going to be uh, rejected by the elders. He's going to be spat upon. He's going to be scourged. They're going to put him to death. And on the third day, he will rise again. So in, Ma- in Mark 16, the women come to the tomb. The stone's rolled away. There's no body in there. That doesn't mean there's... That means the body of Jesus is not in the tomb. Where is it? Well... There's a young man at the tomb. And he says, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. There is a resurrection in Mark. Whoever said there wasn't? And then, and then, I mean, Mark couldn't be a Christian if he didn't believe in the resurrection. And then, what does the young man say, who is an angel? What does the young man say to the women? Go tell Peter and his brothers, he goes before you to Galilee, and you will meet him there. What does that imply? He's alive. He's risen from the dead. You're going to see him in Galilee, just like he told you. So I don't know where we get this this crazy idea that there's no resurrection in Mark. Of course there's a resurrection. Just read the first eight verses. No one can walk away thinking there is no resurrection. You got an empty tomb. You got an angelic being telling you that Jesus is not here. He's risen and telling you, you're going to see him. He's going, to, he's going ahead of you. You're going to meet him in Galilee. So there is a post-mortem appearance that is anticipated in Galilee. Uh, and so that is why I find your, your question very strange. And if Shabir did that, then, 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 then bat on him. There is a resurrection. Just read it for yourself. Okay. Uh... When Jesus appeared to his disciples, they were very difficult to convince. When the women saw him and went and told him, they didn't believe it. In Luke, even when he shows up, they don't believe it. They they think he's a ghost. They have to touch him. You know the story of doubting Thomas. I'm not going to believe. You guys, you 11, you you 10, you say you saw him. I don't believe it unless I put it in. The idea that somebody came back from the dead is exceedingly difficult to grasp. To say that a guy, well, he foretold he'd come back from the dead, but it ends with, well, the tomb's empty, and some guy sitting there says he rose. That's a resurrection? Would you believe that? Isn't it much more reasonable that for some reason that guy dragged the body out of the tomb? How can you say there's a resurrection there? There's, There's a claim made by a young man. There's predictions made by a guy who, unless he comes back from the dead, as he said in John 2, He's the one. Next I had a question this is for Dr. Costa. Uh, I'm a counter by training, and I'm a counter by training. Uh, so yeah. for me, uh, in layman's term, I have a lot of textbooks on my bookshelves. And it ended up that uh, the ones that I use a lot um, often becomes crumble up, obviously, because I use a lot. 
and the ones that I find not very useful are left in a very pressed in condition on my bookshelves. Mm -hmm. So is it possible that um, the uh, majority tax, which is, uh, as you say, an, an um, embarrassment of richness, is actually more representative because the good texts are being copied, copy, 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 so they are no longer left around, whereas the, the critical texts, which are represented by Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, and Adri Adrian Alexandranus, Alexandranus yeah. Yeah, those, like uh, Tishadov was saying that when he found the um, Sinaiticus, the monks were actually burning the leaves, that's what he said, right? Mm. So is it possible that these three more complete dated to the 4th and the 5th century are actually maybe less used because they are not very reliable and therefore the majority, although we don't have the original, that because they're being used a lot, so they're no longer around. Okay, very good question. Let me answer by, by saying, first of all, that when Metzger said we have an embarrassment of riches, he's not just referring to the majority text. He's referring to all of the, the, the manuscripts, the papyri, the Alexandrian, the Alexandrian manuscripts, and also the, the majority text. Now, you, you raise a good point. You see, the, the Byzantine text, the reason why we have so many of them, the reason why they're so similar to each other, and, be, and the reason why they're so well-preserved uh, well is because, once again, when we understand that Byzantium uh, was, was saved from the Islamic hordes that invaded most of uh, North Africa, the Middle East, and Western Europe, um, in that condition, in that state, uh, a lot of these manuscripts were regulated. And, and of course, they were much better preserved than the earlier ones. Um, and so the earlier manuscripts, in the case of Tischendorf, uh, this is one of the, the myths. This is, like when, this is like Darwin's deathbed confession that, that, that he became a Christian, that type of myth. Tischendorf did not say that he found uh, Vatican uh, Sinaiticus in, in, a, in a trash, uh, trash bin. What he tells us is that he saw something in, in, in the, the monastery of St. Saint, of Saint Catherine there in the Sinai Peninsula, and he asked to see it, and they brought him uh, Sinaiticus, which was covered in a, in a, red, uh, a red crimson uh, cover. Now, I don't think people throw crimson-covered books into, into the trash or into the fire. It was, it was covered in a crimson, uh, a beautiful crimson uh, ornate uh, covering that they brought to him. So, so he did not, uh, it was not something that was being thrown out into the trash. That's, that's one of the, the common myths we keep hearing about Tischendorf. But regardless, um, we have these manuscripts from the ancient world. I, I, I explained in my opening statement that one of the reasons why uh, we don't have a, a lot of them was two things. Well, number one, you've got the supplanting of Greek by Latin. You've also got the Islamic invasion that comes and destroys most of Western uh, Christianity and destroys their churches and destroys their books. Uh, whether or not the Library of Alexandria, uh, or sorry, in Caesarea, there is believed that it was destroyed by the Muslim hordes. There were 30,000 manuscripts stored there. Um, and that's why, that's why we have so, many, so, so few of these. Now, when John brought up in his PowerPoint in the year 600, he says, well, look, the Byzantine kingdom was here, 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 here. Well, of course it was. That was before the Muslims took over. Remember, Muhammad dies in 632, not in the year 600, in 632. And after 632, when the Muslim hordes go out of Arabia and start invading, what happened to the Byzantium kingdom? It receded back into Turkey, into Asia Minor. Um, so I, I don't see that as an objection to the reliability of, of those early manuscripts. Um, what I like to know is, is where are these Byzantine text types in the first 300 years of the church? The text type, we see them in, in Chrysostom's writings, but we do not see them in the first 300 years of the church, especially among uh, the church fathers. One minute. Oh, okay. <clears throat> uh, as Tony has said again, is missing the point about the 600. For almost 300 years, the whole Christian world was part of the Byzantium Empire, including Alexandria. If those were the best manuscripts, if that was the best type, that is what would have spread through the entire Byzantine Empire. There's no reason that they would have taken a secondary, inferior manuscript to be their Bible. Okay. Survival of early manuscripts is very rare. Okay. We do not have a stratified sample. Alexandrian manuscripts survive because papyrus is very, very fragile. You, only survives in very hot, dry places. Uh, 
So when we look at the first 300 years, all we have are those papyri. Be and you know where they came from? Everyone that we can try to a garbage dump in Egypt, Oxyrhynchus. That's where they came from. And you know what? You know why they're fragmentary? Because they were torn up by their owners and thrown out into the garbage. The best manuscripts. Do we have time for one more? Yeah, one more. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, question for John. Um, in the book of Luke, chapter 4, uh, the Lord reads from um, Isaiah 61. Um, and in that passage, if you compare it in whether the New King James or King James, um, you'll find words that are different, words that are omitted in one or added in the, in the other one. So um, I'm a little troubled about this um, um, analogy with cadmium and poison and all that, because um, how are we going to look at two different manuscripts, two different um, texts, presumably even from the same Bible? And um, you have to decide. If something is different, it has to be poisoned. Um, I'm not sure if we can, we can go down that road, because um, I don't know how you decide which one would be correct. Did Christ's um, imprimatur on um, Isaiah in Luke, two, Luke 4, um, did that whole precedence, was that the correct text, or would you go with a Masoretic that Christ didn't approve um, in the Old Testament, Isaiah 61? Does that make sense at all? Sorry. Uh, I think so. I'm not sure. Okay, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're getting now not into New Testament text or criticism. You're talking about Masoretic versus... Uh, and as I said before, I in my that. understanding no, yeah, I, is that the Hebrew text that existed in Jesus' day mm -hmm. is not quite the same as the Masoretic text. It was more similar in many ways to Septuagint, and our ancient Hebrew manuscripts prove that. That was my point all along. Things, things like uh, that, that Psalm um, uh, 2216, the fact that the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, actually it's from the Hal-Hever, not the Dead Sea, but that it agrees with that underscores that point. In terms of the poison, though, I, I'm not blaming textual criticism per se. What I'm saying, the poison is a loss of confidence in the authority of Scripture. People don't believe, in, in churches, many churches, the Bible is not forefront anymore uh, because I think a lot of leaders don't really trust it anymore. And the reason they don't is because they have come to believe that it is wrong. It has errors. Okay? Darwinism is a big part of that. Historical criticism is a big part of that. I'm with you on that. Textual yeah, I mean, criticism, yeah. the kind that says that the, the correct original reading is the one that has errors in it, contributes to that. When you see errors of fact, errors of science, mm -hmm. contradictions in the text, you're told this is the way it was originally written. Mm -hmm. And you, you can, you look at it, you see it's an error. And you can try to explain away one of them and find an explanation for a second and find an explanation for a third, but eventually you're going to conclude, you know what, it's not inerrant. And if it's not, you are going to lose your confidence. That, I think, is the poison. It's not the textual Christian per se. It is the erosion of biblical authority. Thank you. Yeah, my concern is that it cuts both ways because, um, you know, rejecting the NIV, ESV for ostensible errors, you know, um, due to textual criticism, that also erodes the faith of many. And I don't think that's necessary because um, knowing the nature of how God preserves his word over time and um, including all that. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Can I say one thing to what he said, though? Yeah, let me, let me, let me just say that I still don't think that I agree with John in the decline in, 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 our, in, in morality and, and the way, where we're heading. And, and a lot of this has to do with the Enlightenment in the, in the 18th century. There's no doubt about it. A lot of it has to do with with the Enlightenment and so forth. Um, however, the, the issue is that the problem is, is much deeper than that. I mean, I mean, when we look at church history and we see the arrival of, of various uh, heresies and false teachings, these were taking place during times when, when, when we had a, a, a text of scripture that everyone believed was, was absolutely reliable. But, but I still have issues with, with John's view on, on the Septuagint. Um, because uh, it's not just Psalm 22:16, or as, as Brother Joseph mentioned, uh, Isaiah 61. But if you read Hebrews 1:6, and it says, uh, and it says there, let all the angels of God worship Him. Well, you can look at uh, the Old Testament. That's not what it says in the Hebrew Masoretic text. Uh, 
but it is what it says in the Septuagint, and that's exactly what it says in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So obviously, the Greek text of the New Testament, of the Old Testament that the Christians use, was not, many of the times, was not equivalent to the Masoretic text, which is the underlying basis of the New King James and the King James Version. Our timekeeper had asked, said to me that he actually had a question, but he couldn't make his way over here. Would, would both of you be okay if uh, Andy would ask the last question? Of course, sure. Okay. Of course. Andy's a good boy. Okay. Aren't they all? So my question is more to John. Um, it was because in some New Testament passages where they quote the Old Testament, it would be different than what we're reading now from our text because majority of it is from the Masoretic text in the Old Testament. So what would be the original reading if there is a difference between the New and the Old Testament in our, like, after the whole, like, text, textual criticism of the Old and New Testament, now there's two different readings. What would be the original one? Wait, I didn't understand the question. What's so, so it's more when you look at the New Testament and it quotes an Old Testament text, mm -hmm. um, it, some passages would be different than the, some passages would be different. So in the oh, New okay. Testament, it would say this, the Old, mm -hmm. the Old Testament says this. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, because our Bible now is after the whole textual criticism stuff, now, it's, now we have a compiled Bible which one would be the original? Are they both original, or are they going to be, is one of them more original than the other one, in your perspective? I, I'd say on the basis of the textual evidence and the, uh, the final revelation from God through his son, if there's a difference between the old, uh, between the reading and the Masoretic text compared to something that Jesus said, I would suspect that there's an error in the Masoretic text. That doesn't mean that the Old Testament is flawed. It would mean that we have been using uh, a manuscript possibly that isn't the best, right? like the NIV does for the New Testament. Right? <laughs> I, guess. Okay, I, I think what John said would seriously undermine the Old Testament. Uh, Shabir would grab this and fly with it. Um, this would undermine the reliability of the Old Testament. Um, and, and the reason for that is because if you were to ask the Greek Orthodox Church, which the Byzantium text was their text, it still is their text. If you ask the, uh, the, the, um, the Greek Orthodox Church today, what is your Old Testament? They'll tell you it's the Septuagint. The Septuagint is more reliable than, than the Masoretic text. What do you think Jerome and Augustine were battling about and fighting about? Jerome wanted to translate the Old Testament from the Masoretic text, uh, or what was known at the time as the Masoretic text, wasn't given that name at that time, but he went to Jerusalem and, and, and studied under rabbis to learn Hebrew so he could translate the Old Testament from Hebrew into Latin. The only complaint he has was the rabbis charge him too much for tutoring him. Um, but what was Augustine saying? He's saying, Jerome, you're supposed to be going with the Septuagint. What's, what, that's, that's the Bible of the, of the church, not, not the Hebrew Bible of, of, the, of the Jews who are apostates anyway and so forth. And, and so I'm really glad that Andy has asked this question. This has really hit, uh, I think, uh, a, a nerve on, in, in this discussion tonight. And that is if, if John applies the same methodology that he applies to the New Testament, to the Old Testament, we are in big trouble. You get rid of the Old Testament, folks, you kiss the New Testament goodbye. Because the Old Testament is the fountain, it is the fountainhead, of the New Testament. It is the Word of God. Jesus called it the Word of God. Uh, the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms, and so forth. A and therefore, uh, folks, this is very, very serious. All you have to do is every time the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, go and check it in the Old Testament. And most often than not, you'll notice it reads very differently. But if you read it in the Greek Septuagint, it's virtually word for word. And so what does this show us? It shows us that the people of God in the time of Jesus translated. They translated Hebrew into Greek, and they also translated into Aramaic which means the people of God has, have always been translating. Septuagint doesn't always read the same as the Masoretic text. We know the Masoretic text because the New Testament does quote from the Hebrew text available to its time, and it reads very different from the Septuagint as well. So we've got a lot of work on our hands. We've still got a lot to study here. I'm going to end the question time here as we are 40 minutes over our scheduled time.
I want to thank you all once again for your patience and endurance. I want to thank the TFPC Church and all of your support in making this event possible. I want to thank all the um, uh, people that were involved. Uh, Bang, who's doing the camera work and taking a lot of pictures, as well as members from the Truth My Day uh, team ministry. Uh, and Andy, of course, our timekeeper, who has been very faithful. Uh, thank you all once again. Uh, please, you are, feel free to contact any, either one of our speakers through email. Uh, they both have uh, websites. Uh, Tony has an apologetic um, blog that he keeps, and John Torres monitors the Truth My Daily website. So feel free to continue to bombard them with questions there. And I will end with a quick prayer, and may you all have a blessed Sunday tomorrow. Let us pray.